I think we can get started. Uh, my humble pranams uh, to Our Holiness Sri Sadguru Ma, pranams to Sri Sadguru, pranam Swamiji. Uh, good morning, everybody in India. Um, afternoon, uh, not afternoon, sorry, early morning in Europe and probably very late evening in the West Coast, especially Dr. Lynette. A warm welcome to everybody to this day two of. Uh, webinar on Balakrishna. Um, after a fairly impressive inaugural yesterday where we had some wonderful talks by uh, distinguished guests, namely uh, Dr. Sarsi Sinha, Professor Bhatt, Representative Padma. Uh, we seem to have lost uh, Ravi. Uh, morning, everybody. This is uh, Shri Kumar here. I'm the chairperson for today, just standing in for uh, uh, Professor Uma Maheshwari, who's unwell. Uh, Ravi seems to have some technical difficulties, so let me just uh, carry the baton from him. Uh, Ravi was just mentioning that uh, you know we will we will be uh, you know he was speaking very briefly about uh, 
yesterday it was truly a remarkable session we had uh, like we have today and in subsequent sessions we have uh, we had some some truly remarkable insights into shri krishna uh, you know the the smaller the krishna the greater the power uh, i'll just take a minute i'm conscious we have started a little late uh, dr lenny thank you for the your patience uh, i promise i will not take more than a minute uh, the the whole uh, uh, you know uh, uh, set of thoughts which we heard yesterday was remarkable in its scope and depth and i'm sure we will all uh, hear the same today as well i look forward to that uh, when we say about krishna you know the smaller the krishna the greater the power which is what her holiness shri sadguru ma once just mentioned in passing um it it obviously covers the physical dimension as a baby he achieved remarkable things uh, it all covers the spiritual dimension in the sense of smallness you know a huge amount of spiritual power gets concentrated in the uh, personality or or whatever we wish to call it of the truly realized souls uh, krishna in his smallness if you look upon krishna as the supreme spiritual then uh, you know he exists in us as the jivatma in various dimensions he is there in his smallness and uh, incredible power um, so with that said uh, i uh, uh, you know very brief self introduction ravi would have done the honors but you know i will just do it myself uh, i am a banker by profession i have been associated with uh, uh, the ashram for uh, more than 30 years uh, i look upon myself as somebody who is striving to uh, improve oneself okay i think uh, and and to me the a uh, wonderful opportunity that uh, uh, the uh, you know we can call it fate we can call it god we can call it karma or whatever the wonderful opportunity i have is to have learned uh, directly from her holiness shri satguru ma uh, just wanted to mention that i will now hand it over to uh, mahesh if you can uh, just uh, introduce dr uh, lignit and then uh, she can continue with the rest of the with her talk thank you so much yeah thanks Thanks, Shri Kumar. I, I just was in touch with Ravi. I think uh, there has been an outage in his home, so I'll pull out uh, the introduction. Just a minute, please. Sorry about the delay. Yeah, so I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Lynn Mary Eight. Uh, Lynn Eight completed a doctorate in South Asian language and literature with an emphasis on Tamil from the University of Wisconsin Madison in 1978. She enjoyed a successful career in as a public administrator working for the state of Alaska, from which she retired in 2004. At that point, she returned to her love of Tamil literature. and began independent research and translations in an adjunct research affiliation with washington state university publishing several academic research articles and two books of translations she is currently finalizing an annotated translation of thirumangai arvars periya thirumuri so over to dr lin eight hello Greetings from the Pacific Northwest in the United States, where it is still Saturday night. I want to thank the organizers of this uh, webinar, um, the Nyana Advaita Pitham, as well as the Sri Vishnu um, Mohan Foundation. Today, I'm going to be looking at uh, the Bala Krishna episode. Let me just uh, get this going. All right, the Bala Krishna episode um, from a literary standpoint, um, and I'm going to be looking at the aesthetic impact of um, on the devotees of the literature itself. What I want to mention uh, up front is that I've illustrated this PowerPoint with pictures from my own collection of vintage religious posters. Now I collected these in the mid 1970s, so all of them are at least 45 years old. So now you know how old I am. Um, 
And uh, many of them were quite old at the time. So these uh, pictures are from posters that are 75 to 85 years old, and I hope you enjoy them. I'd like to be begin by identifying the parameters of this study. Um, Krishna, the Krishna episode is really broken down into five different kinds of components. He ate butter, he was tied up specifically to a mortar, he dragged the mortar between two trees and knocked them over, and at times the trees are ascribed to uh, contain spirits. Um, I'm looking at a survey of literature, and it is not all inclusive, but it does uh, cover most of the significant iterations of the story. Um, when we look at the Harivamsha, we see there is no butter theft mentioned at all. The Krishna and Balarama were naughty toddlers. They, Krishna was tied then around his stomach to a mortar, and he then dragged the mortar between two trees and knocked them down. The trees are described as having been worshipped. With the Vishnu Purana, um, there is also no butter theft mentioned. We see basically the same uh, story of the kids being naughty and the tie to the mortar. But when we get to him knocking the mortar off, I mean, trying to drag the mortar, it's because he very realistically wanted to knock it off. And the trees are not um, possessed of any spirits. I want to move to an earlier uh, Silpadiharam, the Tamil epic where we do find one mention of one component uh, that we've talked about in the butter theft. Here, there is a Dorga-like goddess, Aye. She's called the Pinai, the young girl of the clan. She's also called Mal's young kin, Mal being the dark one and name of Krishna. So she is Krishna's relative and she holds the conch and disc in her hand. She is praised as follows. You were gracious kicking the rolling disguised cart that your uncle made having walked on the Marudu. So she is ascribed the, the episodes of uh, killing the Shakadasara um, and walking on the Marudu rather than Krishna. She is actually um, a Vrishni uh, goddess who protects the clan. And here she is protecting Krishna from his evil uncle. She's also listed in uh, the Silpadiharam as having performed a stilt dance where she's referred to as Mayaval. That's the feminine, the dark woman. Mayavan, the masculine, the dark male, is a name for Krishna. So she is clearly a, a Krishna Vaishnavite figure. And the stilt dance uh, that she performs then is ascribed to Krishna later in Tirumangayalvar's texts. Also in the Silapariharam, we have a reference to the herder community performing a round dance called the Kuravai in Tamil, which is said to have been danced in the Bala Charida dramas. And this is uh, written in Tamil, Vala Sarida Narahangar. So it's actually a transliteration from Sanskrit. So we know that in the fifth century that um, Bala Charida uh, dramas, in other words, ep episodes of Krishna's childhood or being performed uh, for public entertainment. Let's then, uh, we're going to start a chart of all of these episodes and how they occur. And we see so far no butter has been stolen, but the episode of being tied to a mortar has a strong continuity with the mother the tree or Arjuna tree, the same tree um, in Sanskrit or Tamil with, uh, so this is, there's a continuous narrative there. Let's talk about the Bala Charida. It was ascribed to Basa in the fourth century, but we do not actually have that fourth century text. What we do have is a seventh century Bala Charida that was written in the Pallava court. In other words, a South Indian version, and it, it comes from a Kodiyatam a uh, theater repertoire, actually. In that um, text, Krishna goes in and out of everyone's houses eating a whole variety of dairy products. Um, and the neighbors then complain. So there's actually this element of the neighbors' complaints are added when we get to the, uh, to, uh, the Balachayda. And then she ties him with a rope to a mortar around his stomach. So that's uh, int of interest. Um, then after that, it says, 
Tadas Tadapi. Now, my minimal amount of Sanskrit was 45 years ago. Um, so, but if I'm not mistaken, this actually creates a break in the action. Later, Tadas Tadapi, at another time afterwards, when he saw the mortar um, moving, he threw it at Donovas, the demons that were the Arjuna trees. So he actually throws the mortar to at them, then he goes and smashes them and knocks them down um, with physically with his body. So if he was actually tied to the, if he was tied to the mortar, he wouldn't be able to throw it. So I do think there's a break in continuity there that he is throwing the mortar at the trees. So that's also a very unique aspect of the story. I want to talk a little, just a minute about um, another peripheral um, reference. And that is again in the Aichiyo to Kurovai, which is overall dated in the fifth century, but Friedhelm Hardy has very convincingly argued that there are three uh, short verses at the end of Canto 17 that are interpolations that were written at the very earliest at the seventh century and possibly much later. So we have to take this, uh, the dating with a grain of salt. Um, in one of the, oh, also I want to mention, we also know that one of these was written in a Kali Talisai meter, which is um, a bhakti meter that was used very productively by Piti Alvar in the ninth century. Also, there's one of his written in um, Kocha Hakalipai, which is also a later meter. So we see these are interpolations, but what do they have to say? The hands that churn the sea are the hands that were tied by Yashoda's churning uh, rod. So we see that here the hands are turned, he are tied. He's not tied um, around his stomach. Another one says, the mouth that swallowed the worlds is the mouth that ate the butter stolen from the pot nets. Now the concept of stolen comes in Tamil as kalavu, kalavinal, by theft, and that they are stolen from the pot nets from the uri is also, both of those are quite late additions, uh, specific additions. Um, these are not fifth century elements. So we have to take this as somewhere between the seventh and ninth century that these verses occur. So now we're adding to our chart and we see, aha, we now have butter theft occurring on the chart. But by the time the butter theft occurs on the chart and is uh, immediately associated with being tied to a mortar, then we have a break between that and the mud of the trees. And we will follow this. Um, it's a shift in focus, really. Now we can look at the early Arwars. Um, and so we're looking here at the four andadis. We see butter theft as continuing to occur in um, three of the authors. We see here in the Mudal Tilrav Andadi, the first andadi, that Krishna was tied close to a mortar when he ate butter and he sat howling. So um, he didn't immediately uh, move with the mortar, but he sat, he stayed there howling, crying like any other child who's being punished. Um, he it was bound by a rope and we see that he ate ghee and butter and milk. Now there are references to the maradu, but they're separate. And in general, we find throughout the Alvars this very, very simple phrase that he went between maradu. That's all that it says. He went between maradu Malizaibiran also adds to destroy the trees. So we learn a little bit more there. Proceeding to the eighth century, uh, Namalvar, and I just want to point out this darling picture of Krishna is from uh, a package of matches, actually. It was part of the cover of a package of matches, but I kept it because I thought it was sweet. Um, in the 8th century, we see eight, uh, 15 references to stealing butter, which is still very few, considering that Namalvar wrote over 1300 verses. But even out of that, we only see one reference to being tied to a mortar. So it is minimized. Um, we see that after he ate butter, that the herders beat him with a strong rope and he suffered. And then in Thiruvai Mori 131, he wept sitting with a mortar being tied. 
So again, he's depicted as a child who is being punished and is not happy about it. Um, there are references to the mud of the tree, uh, but uh, Namalvar only adds a little more information. He says, Saite having uh, toppled them. So we see when we add the Andadis and Namalvar, again, we have this, uh, we've added the concept of him weeping and suffering as a child, but we have this break uh, in continuity with the mother the trees. When we move to the, a uh, little later in the eighth century to Tirumande Alvar, his city at Tirumadal, we have finally a full narrative of the butter theft episode. The characters are developed along with their personalities. So I want to read this for you so you get the full sense of the story. One day there in a cowherd village, she with the hips in a fine girdle, fine feet, red coral lips and lovely bodice covered breasts, having catching hold of a churning rod to tie it up, after having churned fine curds all of one day, so that her lovely sides ached, that simple lady, her brow full of sweat, putting the butter which had curdled in another pot, then lifting it to the rope netting and storing it so that it rested well, until the time that simple lady went, her eyes like battling lances, he, like one who knows nothing, sleeping in a feigned sleep, then waking and reaching his hands up to his broad garlanded shoulders, and gulping the never sating butter, then toppling a nearby pot full of buttermilk in the place he had previously lain, he lay like one who knows nothing. And she who saw him there as she came back did not see what she had stored, pounding her belly in anguish saying, who, who would come in here except this gentleman? Yes, you did this with a long rope, so all those in the village saw, being of unrelenting rage, tying him tightly to a mortar, as she beat him with his belly unfilled, he could not bear it. So he is depicted again as a, a human child who could not bear the punishment and who is a sneak thief as well. In the Pediatirumadal, um, Tiramange Alvar gives us a little bit more information. Um, in this uh, version, we see that Krishna is creeping in with a thieving eye. He opened a closed door, so they've even tried closing the door against him, and he enters and he gulps curds. And he was tied to a mortar with a strong rope, having been caught by those simple ladies, Madavorho, plural. So the ladies themselves, the neighbors, um, catch him rather than go to complain to Yashoda. Uh, the neighbors themselves tie him up. In the Peri at Tirumori, we see lots more references to stealing, stealing butter, but here the text itself is over is 1,084 verses. So obviously there's much opportunity for that to occur. We see uh, that he's tied with a a rope and five references to the mortars. But again, we see references with wide eyes flooding tears, staying like a dark elephant tied to a stake. So it's very clear he sits weeping and complaining, um, but stays tied. He doesn't move with the mortar to do anything further. In 674, he howled, sobbing, being stuck when tied with an excellent rope to the mortar. Regarding the mud of the trees, Tirumangi uh, Alvar in his pity at Tirumuri does mention the mud of the trees, again, most frequently with just went between mud of the, a very simple phrase, but we do learn that um, the trees broke, that they withered, um, that he destroyed them, pushed them over. Um, we also see that one reference in 834, he walked to break entwined mother to death, having gone with a mortar when a herd has bound him. Now there's no reference to the butter theft in this poem at all. So it's kind of a gap. Um, and I want to read you what comes from 1149. This, it says, worship the toddler who practiced walking, running with a mortar, 
when a full-breasted herder woman tied him to it when he crept up to the butter so that the strong entwined mud of the trees fell breaking. Here we have continuity of the, all the first four episodes without mention of the spirits, but yet there is a strong continuity between all of these in this uh, 11th uh, four nine. And I am very sorry to tell you, however, that for many reasons that I am still researching, I am very strongly convinced that this whole 11th section of the Periathiramorni is an interpolation written at a later date. So I do not find this episode to be from this period. And this is mostly because throughout the whole 11th section, we find a significant use of the modern present tense in Tamil. Now that present tense does, is not used in the first 900 verses of the Periathiramori. So we have to ask, is this uh, still dated this, the same as the earlier part of Thiramori when we find modern present tense uh, so significantly present? No pun intended. Okay. We can move to the ninth century Pedi Alvar Kittamorli, which of course is predominantly about Gopala Krishna, a lot of uh, lovely songs to um, Bala Krishna. And there are many references to the butter theft. Uh, one particularly interesting is that he pushed with thighs and hands those who appeared when they rose from the Bhavadras. So it looks uh, not that he pulled a mortar between them, but he actually pushed them over with his hands and feet. So that's interesting. Um, he, the mortar is mentioned once uh, when Krishna complains to his mother saying, didn't you tie me to a mortar? Um, we do find reference to the Bhanada trees, but again, it's just one simple phrase that he went between Maradas. So we can see now again, the, and I've used color coding obviously, to indicate that there, there are gaps here. We only see one place where there is some continuity, but that's in the text that I am thoroughly convinced is much later. Um, I've added Kula Sekhrin simply because uh, he has just one reference to Krishna's arms being tied. He never says he was tied to a mortar. And Andal is not the least bit interested in the butter theft at all. Um, no references occur. So, I want to, with regard to the butter theft episode, I want to look at the influence on the Alvars initially and of the Alvars after them. So the Alvars predominantly drew from the Harivamsha, and I'm taking this from Friedhelm Hardy's study. And we can see that uh, when we look at the return of Sandipani's children, that episode occurs in the Periya Tirumori as, where, as well as in the Periyalvar Tirumori, and that is in the Harivamsha, but it is not found in the Vishnu Purana. So um, we can see that there is it's identified that contact. I also want to mention a, quite a new uh, article by Dr. Sh Charlotte Schmid. She is a scholar who studies um, Krishna episodes as well as others as they are found in sculptural motifs. She has observed in fifth century North India, a carving that appears um, at, the, at the beginning of panels that show episodes of Krishna's life, like uh, Shakadasura and Putana and so forth. At the beginning of those panels, she has noted a woman churning. This churning woman often is seated or standing next to the churning pot with a child at her feet or next to her with his arms uh, very clearly on the pot or sticking his hand in the butter. Now she perceives this um, not to be, she doesn't see that it's any theft. Uh, we don't see that there's any uh, surreptitiousness about it, but just it, it is a sets the scene that this is a story set in the uh, herder village. It's almost as if it represents the phrase, once upon a time when Krishna was a child in the herder village. And then it goes on to tell the other episodes in the rest of the panel. She has noted that this uh, occurs in the sixth, late sixth and early seventh centuries in Karnataka. And she believes that this um, sculptural motif was in a folk tradition reinterpreted as a butter theft 
and that that influenced the Alvar text in terms of picking up that story from uh, the folk element. In turn, the Alvars then heavily influenced the Bhagavata Purana, which also drew from the Vishnu Purana. The Bhagavata Purana incorporated a lot of new material um, from the Alvar text. Besides the butter theft episode, uh, we see Krishna eating dirt, the demon calf, the splitting the bird's mouth, stealing the gopi's clothes, which become very popular, um, choosing a wife by conquering seven bulls, marrying his cross cousin. All of these are episodes that occur in the Alvar literature first and are drawn into the Bhagavat Purana. So we see how much the Alvars have influenced that text with regard to um, Gopala Krishna stories. In particular, I find that the Gopala episodes seem to be very closely tied to Piri Alvar and his uh, foster daughter, Andal. We see the incorporation of the Pavai Nombu ritual of Andal's Tirupave finds its way into the episode of stealing the gopi's clothes. The Vatsalya Bhakti of Piri Alvar Tirumuni is very well developed in the Bhagavata Purana, even to the extent of saying that Putana gained the destiny worthy of mothers because of her contact with Krishna. I am particularly fascinated by book 10, number 35, which is called the Gopi Song, because we can follow language directly drawn from verses from the Piri Alvar Tirumuri. And not only that, whereas book 10 is completely written in Sanskrit shloka. Number 25, the Gopi song is written in quatrains. How do we know it's quatrains and not just two shlokas? It's a four line verse because of the rhyme, the four lines rhyme, not using Sanskrit rhyme, but using Tamil Yeduhai, second syllable rhyme. So these, this is uh, quatrains, four line verses written in Sanskrit but rhyme using combo uh, rhyming prosody. I think that's fascinating. Let me just read to you from um, one, uh, one verse so you can see how closely tied uh, this is to Piri Alvar. A herd of dazed deer forgot to graze. The just snipped grass slipping from their lips, listening they stood transfixed, immobile, a scene from a painting. Now we go to the Bhagavata Purana, pastured bulls, cows, and deer grouped afar, their minds bereft by the flute playing, with ears cocked and just bitten mouths full, were as if asleep, drawn in a picture. So here we can see there's clearly direct influence from Peri Alvar uh, specifically. Before we move on to the Bhagavata, I just want to look back at um, the nature of the text. The early Puranic texts, without any reference to Krishna's butter theft, focus fully on this uh, supernatural feat of toppling over the trees. Um, the people within the Purana are, are surprised. They are represented as filled with wonder at this feat. Um, the, it is, they are full of fear and awe. So the deity's nature is depicted of one of paratva, of supremacy. When you get to the all of our texts with regard to the butter theft, the reference to the toppling of trees is very minimal. And the uh, mortar, the episode of being tied to a mortar is presented more as a means to depict Krishna's human trait and how he responds as a human child wailing and weeping and unable to bear the pain. So the deity's nature in these verses is shown as one of saulabhya, accessibility. As we move chronologically and geographically, then the nature of these texts changes. The changes accompanied at the time a rejection of the atheistic beliefs of the Buddhists and Jains on, in South India and moved away from a view of God as transcendental, as nirguna, as having no qualities. The Alvars wanted to experience their deity face to face. 
with their um, God having a familiar human face. They wanted to explore human relationships and emotions um, with the deity, that whether a mother or a lover or companion or an angry neighbor or in the Peri Thirumori, even defeated enemy. In order to develop um, those human relationships, it required very compelling and vivid language uh, to have that emotion be evoked. Then after that emotion is evoked and the, the poem builds an aesthetic response, then by referencing the paratha nature of the deity, that emotion can be raised to bhakti. So we're talking about aesthetic mood here. And with the early Puranic texts, um, we really don't have much of a mood because there's really not much po poetry. There's not a lot of kavya in the Puranic texts. It's a narrative and the mood is more of adbhuta rasa, of wonder. The Alvars, however, um, used many rasas, many moods, in particular the loving mood, Sringara, most predominantly, but from the point of Nayaki Bhava, the heroine's emotion, or Vatsalya Bhava, uh, Bhava, the emotions of a mother. I want to mention one thing here. The, if the poetry, when the poetry focus only on Krishna's majesty, it limits the development of human emotion that is needed for a personal relationship with God. When the poetry focuses only on Krishna's human qualities, then it would fail to raise the emotion to the level of religious devotion. You might feel some emotion if you hear a story about a little kid who's your neighbor's nephew's child or something. You might have an emotional response, but obviously it doesn't raise to the level of devotion. So the Alvars were able then to maintain a balance of Salabya and Paratva elements by distancing those elements, creating space between them. And this space opened up, uh, air opened up for the human emotions to flourish and then intensify in the bhakti. Let's quickly skim through then what happens in the Bhagavata Purana. We in, at the beginning see that she, uh, that Krishna brings her joy and she has overlove, overflowing affection for him. Uh, and then we see some philosophical commentary. Then we return to the story where she uh, chuckles at the antics of her son. And then she finds him um, feeding butter to the monkeys. And then we have a philosophical commentary. We return, she holds her son's hand who's weeping and rubbing his eyes, behaving like any human child who's been caught. And she sees that he is frightened and she is overwhelmed with love for him. Then we have philosophical commentary. Only then do we have a short area where he, he's tied to a mortar, more commentary. And then at the very end of that chapter, Krishna notices Kubera's sons who have been cursed to be Arjuna trees. And that chapter ends. There's a break. Then we go to the next chapter, which starts with a very long uh, 22 shlokas that tell the backstory of Kubera's sons. So um, we have stepped aside from the child Krishna, and then it tells us that Krishna knows that he has to fulfill a divine role to remove the um, the curse of the celestials by releasing them from the trees. And so his moving with the mortar between the trees is really a divine destiny. Now we have a huge chart and all the pieces are there. And we see these constant gaps and this separation, even in the Bhagavatam, this huge interruption between the cont continuation of the uh, butter theft um, to being tied to the mortar and him behaving, Krishna behaving like a child. So as the butter theft is added to the story, then the episode of the, the miraculous uh, knocking down of the trees becomes minimized. 
the influence of the Alvars on the Bhagavatam can be seen even at this structural level of creating distance between Salabhya components and Paratva components. Kenneth Bryant did a study um, where he of the strategies and structures that the poet Surdas used in the Surasagra in Brajbasha, I think, in the 15th century. And he observed, even in that text, a uh, use of dramatic space between Laukika, the worldly, and Alakika, Laukika, the unworldly. So even in the influence of the Bhagavatam into later poetry, we see this dramatic space, dramat dramatic distance being used. But why? Why is that? Well, for one, we've seen that the different parts of the episode, the different components evoke different aesthetic moods and they have different poetic goals. So um, those can only be achieved when, they're, when they are separated. Um, the Alvars carefully applied this poetic technique of alterating so that these both could uh, um, be um, successful. And it seems that the ultimate goal of the Alvars was to have a personal experience, a personal relationship of God, and they wanted to share that. But that experience required a two-step process. First, the poetry had to develop um, a human emotion, a personal aesthetic experience in the poetry. In this case, a mother's love, Vatsalyabhava. But secondly, then, it had to be raised that the, to, the poetry needed to raise the emotion, to lift it to a totally different level of experience, to intensify its fervor so that a very personal experience of the deity could be developed, all being nurtured within that very pregnant aesthetic space that was provided by the Alvars in their bhakti texts. Um, before I end, I just want to mention that if someone would like a list of the sources that were used in this talk, you can send me a chat with your email and I will send it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reed. That was, uh, you know, I, I personally have read a few of the texts, not all of them. I'm not an expert or, or a researcher. Uh, you know, it is, it is truly impressive uh, uh, how you have been able to pick up various texts at various points in time, bring them together, to point out what are things for all of us to mull over. It's, it's really good. I mean, thank you so much for that. Uh, you, you just added to my bucket list. Okay, <laughs> I know that I have to buy a bigger bucket now. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, we'll we'll go ahead, Ravi. Back to you. Uh, I hope things are okay on the power front at your house, Ravi. Yeah, sorry about the interruption. I had an outage at my end, so we had a brief uh, cut over. Thank you, Dr. Lin, and thank you, Shrikma. Moving on, um, we move on to the next speaker. I'll have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Prashant Kale. I'm um, uh, sorry, sorry, Ravi. Uh, Dr. Eight, if you, is it possible for you to stay on for a few more minutes? In case there are any questions, I'll drop a uh, chat text to you one on one in case there's any questions. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Prashant Kale um, is going to, his topic uh, of presentation today is Balakrishna and Leela Sukha and Sukumara Kavi poems. Uh, a brief introduction on Prashant Kale. Um, he's an associate professor and head PG and research department of Sanskrit in uh, Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda College, Chennai. He's written books that are available in Amazon, um, notably two of them, 200 Sanskrit Verbs You Should Know, and the Swami Vivekananda. He's also done podcasts on Bhagavad Gita discourse. He has a YouTube channel, Living the Bhagavad Gita Way. He's currently doing Facebook discourse on Sundara Kandam discourse as on 30th of June 2022, 30th of Jan, and pick your pardon. He has had training in Karnatic Vokam in Bharatanatya. He's also written other books, Natya Rasangal in Tamil and Pujay Agaran, Agarandi. I'm sorry, got it wrong, if that's okay, in Tamil. Over to you, Dr. Prashant. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Am I audible, sir? 
Yes, you are audible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, the nice introduction. Thank you, sirs. Uh, respected uh, Swamiji, Swami Hari Prasad Swamiji, and the organizers of uh, Sri Vishnu Mohan Foundation, and also the Nana Dvaita Pitam. My pranams to Sadguru Swamini, Nananda Saraswati Ji. And well, uh, at the outset, I should uh, tell you that I was very much uh, moved by the caption, especially the smaller the Krishna, the greater the power. That's absolutely true because uh, you can see that uh, even in his childhood, that uh, he was very small, but yet so powerful. In the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, he has showed his Vishwarupa, Vishwarupa Darshana Yoga, which all of us know. That he could exhibit even when he was small, when he opened the mouth and showed the mouth to the foster mother, Yashoda, he showed the universe. So the only difference is that the universal form was shown in uh, chapter number 11, Vishwarupa Darshana Yoga of the Bhagavad Gita, whereas the universe was shown to the foster mother Yashoda when he opened the mouth as a small kid. So the Swamini was absolutely correct. Uh, Sadhguru Gnanananda Saraswati Ji was absolutely correct when she said, the smaller the Krishna, the greater the power. Well, coming to my uh, paper, it's a very short paper only. Infant Krishna gladdens our heart. We all, of, we all know that. By way of his charms and childhood flamboyance, he sits firmly in our minds owing to his childhood exploits, like the killing of Putana, annihilation of uh, Shakataswara, the demon who has come in the form of the cart, and so many other uh, demons he killed, even at a very young age as, a, as infant Krishna. And the subjugation of Kaliya, you know, the Kaliya Mardana, just to mention a few. Many a poet in the past, uh, has described the sports of Balakrishna in his work. I congratulate my the previous speaker, uh, Madam Lin, who spoke so nicely about the exploits of young Krishna and uh, the power which he had displayed uh, to great Alvars, especially Trumangi Alvar. Wonderful paper that was. And now, these uh, uh, poets who I said, include Leela Shuka and Sukumarakavi. Leela Shuka wrote the very popular Krishna Karnamrata. And uh, uh, Sukumarakavi was very famous and is very popular in Kerala. He wrote the Krishna Vilasa Kavya. Again, uh, speaking about the uh, place of uh, Krishna as a child and also uh, some other aspects are there in that uh, Kavya. And these two works I took, I'm not going to quote much, many, many of course, but just going to give you a few verses here and there with meanings. So, and uh, these two works speak about the lovely charms of infant Krishna and his childhood prowess. I use the word prowess because the equivalent word you can say to power exhibited during the destruction of demons in a very creative manner. This short paper deals with the manner in which Balakrishna's childhood exploits were described in the above works through some quotations and their meanings. Uh, just only one shloka I took from Leela Shuka's Krishna Karnamrata. It has got many shlokas, but this one, it uh, appealed to me much. This, uh, this, you can see this shloka in the very beginning of the uh, work. Chaturya eka nidhana, Chaturya eka nidhana seema, Chapala apanga, Chata mandaram, Lavanya amrutta vichi lalita drisham, Lakshmi kataksha adrutam, Lakshmi kataksha adrutam, Kalindi pulinangana pranainam, Kamavata arankuram, Balam nilamami vayam, Madhunima, Swarajya Mahatma. 
Sir, sir, of course, Leela Shuka uses uh, tough words. Uh, uh, some, some kind of uh, artificial poetry you can see because just to exhibit his uh, poetic talent, you can see words like uh, chata, mandarma, etc. What does he say here? He says, we worship infant Krishna. How is he? Balam. He is just a child, very small in size. Neelam Agni. And he is of blue hue. Hue means color, blue color. And um, uh, how is he? He is the ultimate limit of cleverness. Krishna was very clever. Even as a child, you know how he uh, took away what is called uh, the uh, butter, etc. And so, uh, so many other leelas he exhibited. Chaturya Ekanidhana. Chaturya Ekanidhana. He was the very ultimate boundary uh, of talent. Real talent. And how was his apanga? How was his sight glance? How were his sight glances? Krishna's sight glances carried nectar with them. Real nectar. That is why we get easily attracted by Krishna. My dear uh, listeners, it's always true that one gets carried away by the side glances. So side glances are very powerful. And in the case of, in the case of Krishna, they are very powerful that uh, we get dragged easily. That is why Krishna is appealing to us. That he mentions in this wonderful. Lavanya Amrita Vichi Lalita Drisham. Drisham means eyes. How are they? Fonded by eyes are fonded by the glances that look like nectar. Lakshmi Katakshadrutam. Katakshadrutam. And how is uh, Krishna? He is respected by even Lakshmi. Lakshmi Kataksha. Glances of Lakshmi. Lakshma, Lakshmi also tends to look at Krishna with reverence. So that is the meaning here. Wonderful words. Kalindi Pulinangana Pranayinam. And Krishna enjoys sporting on the banks of Yamuna. Kalindi means Yamuna. He shows a lot of interest in playing on the sands. Pulina means sands. On the sands of uh, shores of Yamuna. Probably the same thing is now likened to uh, young kids who would love to sport on the banks of the shores of the ocean or the river. Probably Krishna has uh, uh, given that, uh, bestowed that kind of quality to young children. And Kama Avataram Puram, Kama Avataram Puram, uh, Avataram Puram. Uh, Kama Avataram means the uh, birth of uh, the incarnation of Kama. Kama means Manmata. Manmata is, it is believed that he has incarnated as uh, Pradyumna uh, in the womb of Rukmini. Okay? So he is born to Rukmini and Krishna. Pradyumna. Pradyumna is none but uh, the reincarnation of Manmata. Manmata was reduced to ashes, you know, by Lord Shiva. Then, how is uh, this Krishna? So, who has put forth a son by name? Kama, namely Pradyumna. That's it. This is the shloka. And then finally, he says, Balam Nilamami Vayam. Lost uh, Dr. Patans? Yeah, we lost his audio. Okay. I'll try calling him.
this uh, dr lin present mahesh uh, uh, or ravi there's a question for her let me check let me check So, uh, Doctor uh, Kalle is uh, coming back. I think uh, is having a power shutdown, a power outage in his home. So he is yeah. uh, coming back in on his mobile. So I told him that if the bandwidth is poor, he can switch off video. So audio will be better. Okay, fine. I think Shri Kumar, uh, Doctor Lin is no longer connected. I think she's left. So there was a question for her, Mahesh. Just let me know. In case she's joining back, we can ask her that question. I'll send her a mail now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I've I've got your question, Ashish Kumar. Okay. All Am I audible, sir? Yes, uh, doctor. That's yeah, fine. I'm extremely sorry for uh, going off. Not night. a problem. <laughs> These are we the had a similar start in the morning. My the power went off at my place too. So it okay. <laughs> These are the problems with connectivity. Okay, nothing like uh, uh, direct um, seminars. <laughs> it's all right. So uh, yes, I continue. Uh, I told you about my very favorite uh, uh, poet. namely uh, this uh, sukumar kavi why i rate him is that uh, he is very good in his expressions but unsung as i told you uh, uh, when i was telling so he power went up that is uh, we pay a lot of respect to poets like kalidasa uh, bhavabhuti uh, madha uh, shri harsha etc but these kinds of these kind of poets are not given much uh, attention one such poet is uh, sukumar kavi when i just explain one or two verses you will definitely agree with me i am sure he says in his uh, uh, krishna vilasa kavya mukta bhava madhurena ranjayan shaishavena hrudayam prajokasam gokule sa vijahara keshavah kshira vari nidhim api achintayan what a beautiful shloka he says wonderful verse he says uh, infant krishna hmm? shaishava shaishava means childhood in his childhood what he was doing he was simply gladdening the hearts of cowherds shaishavena hmm? hrudayam brajokasa brajokas means uh, how cowherds so he was gladdening the hearts of the cowherds ranjayan gladdening that mukta bhava madhurena madhurena by the sweetness of his mukta bhava childhood um, in tamil in tamil they say cheshte exploits childhood uh, uh, actions he was simply gladdening the hearts of all the cowherds they were he was very much dear to the cowherds and what did he do at that time how how did he feel gokulesa vijahara he is ported in gokula gokula where nanda gopa was there yashoda was there so he is ported in gokula kshiravari nidhim api achintayan achintayan totally forgetting api even kshira vari nidhi vari nidhi means ocean even milky ocean that was his primary abode milky ocean is his primary abode as vishnu so he forgot even his primary abode uh, when he started playing or while he was playing in gokula these are the wonderful thoughts of sukumar kavi then uh, he says vadanam how was the young krishna i am going now to describe i am going to describe vatapatra shai all of you might have seen what it is always good to have vatapatra shai in homes krishna trying to suck his uh, uh, the toe the bigger toe of the foot mm, with his mouth that is a very good picture to have at homes 
and look at uh, sukumar kavi how beautifully he portrays that particular scene vadanam madhusudanah karabhyam charanam gushtam upanayat pipasuhu galiteva tata surasravanti nagamukta mani didi pichchalena what does it mean vadanam madhusudanah madhusudanam is at krishna the killer of the demon madhu karabhyam with his two hands the child cannot have hold only one hand with one hand so krishna uses both his hands charana angushtam the bigger toe of the charana foot hmm? upanayat he pulled it vipasahu with a view to drink child no even in our homes you can see young children doing that kids doing that or infants doing that galiteva tata surasram how did how did it look like at that particular juncture it looked as if i tell you heavenly ganges flowed in the guise of the rays that emanated from the pearl gem like nail of the foot see all of us have the nails in the foot but there are rays emanating from krishna's nail of the foot that uh, rays that emanated from the nail appeared like heavenly ganges flowing so pure were even the rays that emanated from the nail of the foot of krishna that is how he described then elsewhere he says amrutam juhu iva aparah pramodam nayananam janayan sa padmanabah sa padmanabah who is padmanabah vishnu that is krishna janayan he generated pramodam happiness nayana naam nayanam means ice he generated he kindled the eyes of people around him amrutamshu hu iva aparah aparah as if he is another amrutamshu moon we all uh, would not like to see the sun god directly but we would all love to see moon directly because moon uh emanates what is called moon gives out rays of nectar so krishna appeared like infant krishna appeared like aparaha uh, amrutamshu amrutamshu who means another name for moon that gives out amshu rays of amruta nectar so uh, krishna generated the happiness of the eyes of all the people appearing like uh, another moon clear oh look at the words how simple they are Uh, as opposed to the words used by <laughs> lila shukar lila shukar was a very talented poet and this particular poet exhibited his talent through ideas fancies poetic fancies what is poetic fancy poetic fancy is upreksha imagining things poetry is nothing but imagining things in a healthy way that is called poetry so and how was krishna young krishna they said people said ha you give me to my home i will have it for 10 minutes i will have him then another person came another cow heard no 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 it's time out for you i would carry krishna to my home like that bhavanam bhavanat karau karabhyam pradeyoshitihi aniyata ankam ankat says uh, sukumar he was led from bhavana bhavanat he was led from one mansion to another mansion karau karabhyam from one pair of hands to another pair of hands Uh, and anka mankat from one lap to another lap vraja yoshit bihi by the wives of the cowards he was dear to all uh, uh, women so they were all taking him from one mansion to another mansion from one pair of hands to another pair of hands and also from one lap to another lap he was transported so that was how krishna uh, became the darling of the masses when he was young and now with two more shlokas i would wind up my short speech balakrishna's fans fascination for butter the earlier speaker also mentioned it his lovely hair krishna had a very lovely hair in his uh, childhood and his infallible friendship with kuchela sudama my dear uh, viewers uh, krishna's friendship with kuchela is unquestionable and uh, are aptly described in the following verse from balakrishna ashtakam it's a rare work only ashtaka uh, a collection of eight verses balakrishna on balakrishna 
because this webinar is on Balakrishna, written by Jeevanesha. Jeevanesha is a, one, a good poet. And uh, all poets are good. They all had talent. Po poetry does not come out just like that. There has to be the blessing of Saraswati. In Jagannatha Pandita, in his Rasagangadara said that oh, by two things one can have Pratibha. Pratibha means a creativity. Hmm? Mahapurusha Devata Prasada. One, either we should have the favor of Mahapurushas. Hmm? Then we can start writing even at a young age. If we don't have that, then we can rely on two more things. What are they? Yutpati and Abhyasa. Yutpati means constant practice, reading of books, huh? constant practice of writing, reference to dictionaries, hmm? and Abhyasa, training. If we have these two, constant reference and practice, then also we can write poetry. So one should not give up hope. Poetry is possible at any age, provided we make an effort, at least relying on the second uh, opportunity. First opportunity, all of us may not have what is called Mahapurusha Devata Prasada. Only a few of us may have. But all of us can practice and refer to books and other things. So that is a wonderful statement by Jagannath Pandita. I'm just bringing out your notice. So this wonderful shloka, Leela ya kuche elamo nipalitam krupa karam, Neela neela mindra neela neela kanti mohanam, Bala neela charupa komalala gambilasa, Gopala bala jara chora bala krishna mashraye. Gopala bala jara chora bala krishna mashraye. Chora, thief. He's not a thief. He's a thief of two things. Thief of butter and thief of hearts. Then, Leela ya kuche lamoni. Kuchela is mentioned. See? Eh? And how beautiful is it? Eh? See? And charu komal alakam. Alaka. Alaka means uh, braid of hair. B R A I D. Braid of hair. So, Komala. Wonderful braid of hair Krishna had. Then, the fact that Balakrishna is worshipped by Vibhishana. Balakrishna is worshipped by Vibhishana. What is Balakrishna? How is he worshipped by Vibhishana? Don't take direct Balakrishna. Balakrishna is Vishnu. In the sthapana that took place at Sri Rangam by Vibhishana. Even now, it is believed that Vibhishana visits at the dead of nights to Siranga to pay respects to Siranganatha. So Vibhishana worship Krishna. So that is mentioned by uh, this poet Jivanesha. Shesha bhoga shayinam vishesha bhushano jvalam goshamana kinkini vibhishana diposhanam Look at the words. How he plays with shasha etc. Shoshana kritam budhim vibhishana architam padam Gopala Bala Jara Jora Bala Krishna Mashraye hmm? Gopala Bala Jara Jora Bala Krishna Mashraye Vibhishana Di Oshanam who was nourished, worshipped by Vibhishana. Vishesha Bhushana Ojwalam. So Krishna's uh, liking for spectacular ornaments is mentioned here. Krishna is a, uh, he's a lover of ornaments. <laughs> So, look at even the pincha. That itself is an ornament for him. And uh, see how wonderfully described by it is uh, described by Jivanesha. Uh, so, I am just summing up my paper. My papers usually are very short. So, that I mention. Thus, we can see that infant Krishna is worshipped and praised by Sanskrit poets. Many poets have done that. I have, we, we know so many other poets have done that. But here, um, uh, I have given uh, with a humble effort with reference to only two poets, namely uh, Leela Shuka and Sukumarakavi of the past in their lyrics. Apart from the above mentioned poets, I have to just bring your attention to one more before I wind up. There is a poet by name Satavahana. He wrote in Prakrit, which is not Sanskrit. And that's why I don't want to read it out. Gatha Saptashati. That is the name of the work. In that Gatha Saptashati, there is a shloka which can be translated into English as follows. Wonderful. Great imagination of uh, poetry fancy. When the infant Krishna caught hold of the breast of Yashoda, when infant Krishna caught hold of the breast of Yashoda with his pair of hands to drink milk, 
with his pair of hands to drink milk. He recollected his conch, Panchajanya. He recollected his conch, Panchajanya, and had horripilation on his body. That infant Krishna. So look at the poet's imagination. What an imagination! So which shows that he will be using Panchajanya in his this in this avatar also. Can we guess? Yes, your guess is correct. In the Kurukshetra war, Krishna blew his Panchajanya before the commencement of the war. Followed by Dharmaraja and others. Hmm? Bhishma blew from their camp and Krishna started from Pandava's camp. So Krishna was reminded of the Panchajanya that he has to use it somewhere, even in this avatar. So probably towards the end of the avatar. Afterwards, uh, you know what happened. Thank you so much for listening patiently and again, I uh, seek apology for uh, the um, uh, power failure in my home, which was uh, resurrected. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Prashant Kelly, sir, wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, really, I mean, you obviously, you, what should I say? These texts have become part of you, if you know what I'm trying to say. You know, these learnings, the ways in which uh, Sri Krishna has looked at it's very nice. Uh, you know, I've read the Bhagavad Gita at least once, tried my best to reflect on it, but you know, this, this Vishuru Padarshanam, uh, compared to the whole universe, it's a wonderful uh, new way to look at it. You know, it's same Bhagavad Gita, it's, you know, <laughs> but what different ways to look at it. It's really wonderful. Thank you for that. Personally, you know, just thank you for that. Uh, you had mentioned about uh, Sukumara Hari as one of those uh, poets whom uh, probably we don't know much about compared to some of the other uh, great uh, poets. You know, the way in which uh, uh, you mentioned his description of uh, Vatapatra Shai, you know, all that. It is so, it is vivid, you know, it, it, it brings it front. So clearly as a Kavi, he, he wrote what he saw. He wrote what he experienced, you know. So that is so beautiful. Like uh, we read about Esha uh, Dipada Varnanam by Markandeya uh, Rishi in one uh, text and uh, uh, the Sriman Narayaniyam, you see that, uh, you know, Bhattadri. The, yes, Bhattadri, the Agre Pashyami, where from uh, forehead to the toenails, you know, the, the light of the moonlight shining on the, shining through the toenails, that uh, part of it, you know, it comes, I was thinking about exactly that when you spoke about that, uh, you know, when Krishna is uh, uh, in that, in that pose, you know, sucking his toes. That beautiful light. And I was thinking about that. That's all I'm trying to say. Really, very nice, sir. Very, very... I am fortunate to have uh, uh, heard it. Uh, like all these things, you know, it is uh, never satisfying. We want to hear more and more. With uh, God's grace, we'll have the opportunity in future. Very nice. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Ravi, back to you. Please take it forward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patan Kali. Moving on, we'll I'd like to introduce you to the next speaker. Uh, Professor Godabhari Mishra. His topic is Sri Krishna Karanamritam. A brief introduction on Dr. Mishra. He's no stranger to the foundation. He's had uh, numeral interaction with us. He's spoken in the past on many occasions. Dr. Godabhari Mishra is a former professor and head of the Department of Philosophy at Madras University. He's an authority on Vedanta and also Buddhism. After retiring from the University of Madras, he was associated with the Madras Institute of Development Studies, ADR Chennai. He has been, as I said, associated with SVM for many years, participating in and organizing many summits. Over to Dr. Mishra. Uh, Dr. Mishra, we are, not, we are not able to hear you. I think you'll have to unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, is it okay? Yes, it's okay, Doctor. Uh, just one second. Huh? Just one second. Am I audible to you, Mahesh? Yes. Yes, sir. Shall yes. I put up my video, or you would like me to put on that? 
No, no, it's very clear, sir. Please, we want to see you also, sir. Turn it please on, please. Turn it on. You also. Yeah. Please turn it on. Okay. <clears throat> okay, just a minute. Uh, <clears throat> just a minute. Okay. Uh, Swamiji is there? Swamiji has not joined us yet, but he will be joining okay. shortly. Okay, it's okay. Like a... So... Today, I feel it a great fortune to be associated with this seminar in which we are talking about the essence of our tradition, the crux of our culture, the epitome of our you know, heritage, which has come down to us you know, for many millennia through many, through many channels, that is Krishna. Friends, uh, today it is a very difficult day for me to speak because I have been asked by Swamiji to speak on Leela Sukha. Sukha Maharshi speaks on liberation and you know the context in which he speaks for giving Jnanam to Parikshit Maharaja. And here Leela Sukha speaks about pristine nature of the Lord Krishna and I would like to go along with, travel with you for a while in giving you what is the essence of this Krishna Karnamrata. First, friends, it is a very difficult job to speak about Krishna Karnamurta as Lila Sukha time and again says, you know, the language is not enough, O oh Lord, to speak about the, the glory. Whom am I speaking about? You know, first, it is very difficult to decide who is loving whom. Bhakti, Bhakta is loving to the God or Bhagavan to the Bhakta. That type of a synergy, a symmetry is being brought in this, in this text of Leela Sukha. I would like you know, uh, to put off my, to this, what is that called as? Uh, uh, this video so that you know there is no problem. Is it okay, Sir Is it? It is fine, Doctor Mishra. Okay. Okay. It's then fine. let me. Go. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Just go ahead. We are enjoying so, every moment of it. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, you know, in this uh, Krishna Karna Amrita, we we find the pristine law. That is why I, when Swamiji asked me to speak on this, I thought of giving a title to my presentation as a portrayal of pure love and loving devotion in on Krishna. So, like, first, I would like to give one small comment which I have been thinking to do, that is, in law, 
thinking vanishes in love when somebody loves like there cannot be any thinking the love always takes you to get united tadatmya you ek hi bhav when you become one you love something this love takes you to a state of non thinking and when thinking is not there in non thinking that is love non thinking in love thinking vanishes and language commits suicide in love that is what i am coming to the whole of my description like accounting of lila sukha is meant for saying this much that that you know in 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 love pure love that love which is this time love love for the god the 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 neither thinking nor language can stand if somebody loves he cannot think and coming to a mundane level he cannot think properly if somebody loves and thinking is improper the language fails to convey what exactly he would like to speak or there is no language at all in love there is no language and in that is the state which 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 you know all vedantins have been speaking about all the texts have been speaking about and that is what is the main point you know that is being portrayed account given by lila sugar friends what like <clears throat> like i i before i go to lila sukha i have been reading lila sukha because of swami ji thanks to swami ji thanks to sadguru amma and today is a great day you know the day when shri vishnu hon uh, the bharth day so i i am i'm happy that it is an occasion swami ji has given to speak so what is like love how is love manifested is being spoken by chaitanya chaitanya mahaprabhu sri chaitanya which is you know in a way brought from the writings of lila sukha chaitanya comes after lila sukha lila sukha to my reading lila sukha is a, like history 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 lila sukha is an enigma whether he was from kerala or not i'll come back to that particular point little later but chaitanya talks but i come from chaitanya tradition i'm from orissa and i come in the tradition of sri chaitanya and bhagavata is the text which we 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 worship more than just reading that is that is the tradition and what chaitanya how how chaitanya puts it is a very, very brilliant way chaitanya puts chaitanya i you know say says nayanam galata sudharaya vadanam gadgadarudhyagira pulake nichitam bapu kada tava naam grahane bhavishyati language is is gone it's not a great scholar did not write it much only shikshya stakumi the only text available in that text chaitanya says this nayanam gala dasu dharaya krishna this is love i am i am i am taking you with a journey with a travel please join me in this walk log walk today for another 20 minutes log walk walk on with love love work how how it has happened in our tradition which has been preeminently brought before us by 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 sadguru see her face those who have her picture just see by closing your eyes you try to see nayanam galadasu dharaya you know i am not my i cannot see because the the tears are been flowing down when i remember you go krishna the that the eyes are coming to see badanam gadgadarudhaya gira my speech is totally blurred i cannot speak what do i speak 
ತದ್ಗತ ವೃದ್ಧಯಾಗಿರ ಪುಲಕೇ ನಿಹಿತ ಹರಿಪಿಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಮೈ ಬಾಡಿ ಫುಲ್ ಬಾಡಿ ಇಸ್ ಹರಿಪಿಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ವಾಟ್ ವನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ತವನಾಮ ಗ್ರಹಣೆ ಭವಿಷ್ಯ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಹ್ಯಾಪನ್ ಯುವರ್ ನೇಮ್ ವನ್ ನೇಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ರೀಫಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಕೂಲ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ನಿಲಾಸುಗ ಇಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಟ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ಐ ಆಲ್ ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಯು ಟು ದ ನಿಲಾಸುಗ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ ಜಾರ್ನಿ ವಿತ್ ಇನ್ ಲವ್ so that that is another another beautiful shloka and i i am to bring chaitanya chaitanya comes after lilasuka even you know bhattatri comes after lilasuka jayadev comes after lilasuka and vedanta desika comes after lilasuka like lilasuka must be 11th century that we can come to that chaitanya says yugaitam nimeshena chakusha prabrusaitam ಶೂನ್ಯಾಯಿತಂ ಜಗತ್ ಸರ್ವ ಗೋವಿಂದ ವಿರಹೇಣತೆ ಸಿ ಗೋವಿಂದ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಇಲ್ಲ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಓ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಇನ್ ವೆನ್ ಐ ಎಂ ಸೆಪರೇಟೆಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಯು ಯುಗಾಯಿತ ನಿಮೇಶನ್ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೆಪರೇಷನ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಎ ಲೈಕ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಮೋ ಲೈಕ್ 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 ಯುಗ ಮೆನಿ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ವ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಯುಗಾಯಿತ ನಿಮೇಶನ ಚಕ್ಷುಷಾತ್ ಪ್ರಾಭೃಷಾಯಿತ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ಲೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ವಾಟರ್ ಫ್ಲೋಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ರೇನ್ ಇನ್ ಮೈ ಐ ಇಸ್ ಒನ್ ಸೆಕೆಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಪರೇಷನ್ ಶೂನ್ಯಾಯಿತ ಜಗತ್ ಸರ್ವ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಬಿಕಮ್ಸ್ ಎಂಪ್ಟಿ ವ್ಯಾಕ್ಯೂಮ್ ಎಸೆನ್ಸ್ಲೆಸ್ ಶೂನ್ಯಾಯಿತ ಜಗತ್ ಸರ್ವ ಗೋವಿಂದ ವಿರಹೇಣತೆ ಓ ಗೋವಿಂದ ವೇನ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಸೆಪರೇಟೆಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಯು ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ now in one of the verses don't have time to talk to him what he tells krishna you can take lilas ko right so i am not going to the sanskrit verses not much time he says you are taking away my hand sorry you are giving up my hand and running away but try to take yourself away from my heart see how he is telling he is telling that you have what you have done see how the equation that is my beginning i told the bhakta is great or bhakti sthana the god is great both are great both become one god follows bhakta i will tell you that krishna the beautifully beautifully the love does not you know in the in the in the world of love all these things become 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 very very elementary very you know they, 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 they don't carry much weight so this is the state i am trying to invite into you the state of love the state of celebration of the world how will you celebrate the world all this all these people are doing celebration of the world shankara did buddha did i have been always telling ramanuja did i'm going to read four mathas to celebrate raman jo died 4000 mathas to celebrate so did madhva chaitanya everybody celebration of the world how will the celebration of the world will come celebration will come when you love without love there is no celebration see when you love celebration starts so so as as i told you this is the the contradiction that i am in today you know uh, that is that is that is my that is that, that is the main topic that i would like to bring you for you as i told you in love thinking does not thinking thinking does not work when thinking is not there language will not work. in essence and we are talking with the language this is the contradiction this is a contradiction for everybody the, the how like there would be some some language to speak and what is that language chaitanya says is only krishna one word is enough anyway you know uh you know that is why one of the western poets i think tennyson said it is better to love better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all in the world you can you can see this you know see this so now i will bring you to 
that joining with love what has happened but how it has happened in 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 lila sukas krishna karna krishna karna vrata starts like this you know chinta manir jayati soma girir guru me shiksha guru cha bhagavan sikhi pincha maulihi yat pada kalpataru pallava sekareshu lila swayambar rasam labha tejaya srihi you know he says that chinta manir jayati let me bring you to the life of vilasuka uh, it seems you know uh, uh, the 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 vilasuka was a brahmin and deeply in love with somebody called chintamani and chintamani was not chintamani was a, a like a, a lady and chintamani and he, he was so much enamored with chintamani that he was doing all sorts of things in order to get her and now what happens one day at night he the rainy night that you know lilashka which is who is called as villa mangala he he goes to her house at night and then chintamani it seems shows herself the her body and he feels how the ugly the body is how you like when the when the law see in love there is no body in love body love is something which which is beyond the body that is to be understood in the writings of i uh, this and what happens so he he cheat he he like she cheated him disgustingly and and he says that if you would have a little love for god it it can be it can made a lot of difference for you and that is why he is the 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 shloka starts चिंतामणिर जयति सोमगिरिर गुरुर मे शिक्षा गुरुश्च भगवान सिखि पिंच मौली यत्पाद कल्प तरुपल्लव शेखरेशु लीला स्वयंवर रसम होते जय श्री सो ही जस्ट ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन ऑफ मुंडन लव टू डिवाइन लव दिस सी ऑलवेज देयर इज अ पॉसिबिलिटी दैट यू कैन ट्रांसफर दिस लव टू दैट यू नो this this is this is this is what is this is what is happening in all this in all these writers in all this the bhakti is this the essence of bhakti is this and he starts with that person chintamani can also be god so chintamani jay to chintamani bhagavan so a a mundane love getting transformed into the divine love is the essence of this text and you know as i uh, as i just told you i'll come back to the philosophy little later with like uh, but, but i want to talk a little about uh lilasuka they say lilasuka is from where lilasuka is from we do not know but lilasuka's texts were discovered by chaitanya mahaprabhu and there are many commentaries written in chori by telugu and uh, um, telugu uh, uh, telugu writers and uh, there are so many commentaries like uh, one of the very mature commentaries written by gopala bhatta who is uh, who is the uh, like uh, in whose tradition gopala bhatta was a, a disciple of sri chaitanya mahaprabhu in whose tradition sri vachcha goswami who visited and spoke on this occasion few years back comes and uh, and uh, there are so many other things so large number of commentary on this text but i would like to, you know there are there are many uh, many references also which can uh, prove that the text might not have been written in kerala see many texts are preserved in their original form in kerala 
Kerala, see, I when I went to Kerala, at, in the in the evening I heard many temples. This Jayadeva Sastapadi is being sung. You know, they have developed a unique culture of preservation of traditions. As you know, most of the texts also in Sanskrit texts, uh, like a Kautil Swarta Shastra and uh, the Bhav, like uh, what is that? Uh, Bhasas uh, dramas all were discovered from Kerala. So many traditions were kept in the in the, in the original form in Kerala. So maybe Bilba Mangala is from Kerala. We cannot say. But if you say that his time is before Jayadeva, then it is a little unlikely that he is from Kerala. But that is a, that is a contested thing. I don't want to go. There are two words I would like to put like a, uh, which 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 uh, which may suggest that he is from somewhere bengal odisha or or some uh, andhra or some there is one word dolayamananayanam dolayamananayanam dolay dola is not uh, does not seem to be a sanskrit word the eyes quivering in another Go through, like in 149, I read because of Swamiji as you know wanted me to speak on this. So I read this text in 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 in, in Krishna Karnamurta 149. He says, Dola Yamana Nayanam. Dola Yamana word is not. I don't know whether this word Dola Yamana relating to the like uh, eyes. Dola. Dola means to you know, um, giving side glances is there in Malayalam. It is not, does not look to be a Sanskrit word. Another, go through it, who sarita, who sarita. Another, very, very, like, I, 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 since I have gone into the text a little carefully, I found there are many words which suggest his being from some other place other than Kerala, but he might be a Keralaite. Going to the different places, understanding the traditions, and then, uh, then, then, then writing this. Then, uh, so that that is one one thing I wanted to tell you because I want to place the time of Lilasuka before Jayadeva. You know, Jayadeva is you know trying to bring the law with the words. But Lila Sukha is trying to bring meaning. A little goes off. So Lila Sukha comes first and then Jayadeva. Then I would put uh, Vedanta Deshika. Then uh, uh, Chaitanya. Then Vatadri. So that is, that, is the, that, is the, that, is, that is how I would like to say. So this is, this is, this is, the, this is the tradition. So Lila Sukha, uh, uh, you know, tries it 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 it, it 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 brings up the supreme prema bhakti in a, as the as the major sentiment in this text you know and what he does the you know the the the, the child the balya bala krishna becomes the major contention of his description and the the melodious simplicity and uh, the the sweetness i don't think there is any parallel to lila sukha in the history of sanskrit literature and one more thing the esoteric interpretation of lord's deeds so and you know the karma bhakti and jnana they all come together and like they they they, they he, uh, lila sukha is very clear that you know the this this prema alone can bring about liberation all these things are not not necessary and one more thing Vilasuka says is very important he says that do we need like he 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 says that you know it is important to have a small realization than hundreds of textual knowledges that is why i was telling you that it is so important to have love. Then in love you see, which in words you cannot see. 
you the the why the 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 the, the law of the thing is not connoted by law of the word okay and as you know lila sukha was 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 not a vaishnava that is another point which i wanted to bring you for you to say that in you know being a saivite he very very clearly says i am not doing sandhya vandana in many you know in many places like nitya karma sandhya vandana and everything is sacrificed for the sake of love for krishna that is what sandhya vandana bhadramastu bhavate you know he says so and 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 as it, as, as it is written is very clear that he has a great love for shiva and so like saiva vayam na khalu tatra vicharaniyam he says that i am a saiva and there 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 is there is nothing to be nothing to feel anything about it but still i am so much given to the law this this is a this is a poetry of law word of law so that is why you know uh, that is that is that is how he uh, he, he tries to uh, you know he tries to show the pure law i will show you one 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 text where 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 love is being depicted you know <clears throat> so when when uh, you know uh, when the 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 love there are two things two things krishna forgets and gopis also forget i'll show you one 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 particular place where he describes it now one gopakanya has gone to sell the 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 butter and all the milk produces that she has made and what has happened she is not you know mind is not in selling the produces mind is in the krishna and what she does she should say that i have brought milk take milk take all this milk produces whatever products but instead she says gobinda damodara madhaveti i will i will take a little time to tell you about that verse vikriyetu kama kila gopakanya to gopakanya the milk maid sets out one day to sell her milk products murari padar chita chitta vritti murari padar chita chitta vritti and chitta vritti the mind is not there in the selling the waters it is in it is it is it is but her thoughts were with the feet of lord krishna dadhyadikam moho vasad abojat and all this dadhi the cord and all that she has taken she forgot about all those things and spoke moho vasad out of her love for krishna he says Govind Damodar Madhavi. See the words. As I told you, have failed because the mind is not there to describe the world. A lot of mystical interpretation is possible. I have told Swami Ji that, that sometimes on Jaya Devas mysticism, I will talk because people say that it is a story of sex. friends as i told you in love infatuation infatuation vanishes sex commits a suicide that is my conclusion that i would come to how much time i have i have um, mohesh another 10 minutes our time yes, is up you have another 10 minutes sir okay so 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 gobinda da modar madhaveti you know this is the this is the thing and another verse i am not going to the verse i am not going to the verse sanskrit i am not going i am just telling the meaning where time is up what is happening the the gopaganya the gopika is milking or not where there is no pot below because she is her mind is 
not there in milking it is in krishna and what krishna is doing he is milking a bull he is a bullock a bull because mind is there in the gopi so that is why i am telling that devoted and a devotee they both become one in devotion love unites lover and the beloved so that is that is that is the that is the that is the that is the, that is the thing and this is this is the tradition this is the tradition and this is a uh, this is the tradition that which lilasuka develops such a brilliant way everywhere you find some great description of krishna you know like all all the great singers almost start with the 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 the, the, the shlokas the verses that lila sukha writes in his in his book krishna karnamrita everywhere in the vaishnava sampraday is uh, full of such eulogies like being done to krishna before any singing takes place in a singer takes place and and i i don't want to uh, go into all that details but i would like to say that how this tradition is being carried forward by 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 you know na by 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 all the writers okay now lila suka says that you see he, he he tries to he tries to say belittle the tradition of vedas he says paramrushyam dure parishadi muni nam pratavathu trusham drushyam shashvat tribhuvana nayanam drugiva drugiva sari nayano hariva pusham anamrushyam vacham anida mudayanam mai kada daridrushye deva daridalita nirodpala nibham he says that you see brajavadhu drusham drushyam see this this people those who are not lorded they are all in the village of braja but you have made yourself available to them not to the not to the people those who have been doing vedas anushthanas and and those who have been trying to understand you through one upanishad anamrushyam vacha like you have not made yourself available through the language and now you have made yourself available to these these girls these people from raja see what is a, what is a contradiction so i would like this path than that path you know that is that is this is what what is that what, what is happening in 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 in, in, in gopa uh, sorry in in vraja in in gopis they are seeing they are seeing the god right in front of them aparoksha anubhava see that is what i would like to take you you know how there are tinges of vedantic thinking in 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 in, in uh, what is that in uh, in uh, lila sukha krishna karnamrita one verse i would like to tell you know what is happening the child krishna is crawling on the floor marble floor of nanda how it is rights lila sukha rights ratnasthale janu charah kumarah ratnasthale in a marble floor the kumara krishna is crawling ಸಂಕ್ರಾರವಿಂದಂ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೀಸ್ ದ ರಿಫ್ಲೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಅವರ್ ಫೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಸೈಡ್ ದ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಮಾರ್ಬಲ್ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಆದಾತು ಕಾ ಮಹಾ ತದ ಲಾಭ ಕೇದಾತ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವಾಂಟ್ಸ್ ಟು ಲೈಕ್ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಯು ನೋ ಆರ್ನಾಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಓರ್ನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೋಸ್ ಆರ್ನಾಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಟ್ರೈಂಗ್ ಟು ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಫ್ಲೋರ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸಿ ಭಗವಾನ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಆಸ್ ಎ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ ಸಿ ದ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ದ 
child is crawling on the floor seeing the ornaments beautiful ornaments and things around her body sorry his body in the floor and trying to get it and not getting it adatu kamaha tad labha kheda tad labha kheda that is not coming those those he is not able to extract those ornaments from the reflection vilokya dhatri vadanam rurod and she he started weeping that i am not getting these ornaments and then looking at the dhatri the nurse the maids fesh dhatri vadanam vilokya rurod she starts crying this is this is being used by apyadikita a great a great a great atwitin saying how even krishna is subjected to illusion anyway that is a different thing so so you know so that is that is that is how uh, the whole uh, the whole 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 uh, krishna karnamrita is uh, being uh, being described described with the idea of pratyaksha to have pratyaksha of of uh, of uh, of of the god which is which is preeminently as i told you taken by the by the writers writers of the of the 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 the, the uh, later years like bhattatri tadri outstanding writing he has made in uh, like one of the best i would say like uh, they, how how like there is a there is a there is a requirement sambhoga and vipralamba shringara that is written but vatadri takes it to the height of height of aparoksha anubhuti i'll come to that you know that i was i was i was, I was, I, was I, i i would like to quote one from lilasuga he says lilananam buja madhira mudikshamanam narmani benu vivares vivesayan nivesayanta dolaya mana nayanam rolling eyes ोकनीय He says, "I see in front of me, a parochian who has come to me." In the in the in the, in the last verse, he says, "You so plavito ham tadunu tadu dore dibya kishor dibya kishor avesham tarunyaram paramyam paramasukharasha swadaroman jitangehi rabi tam naradadhihi bilasadupan sad sundari." mandala ischa all the upanishads everybody everybody has told all the everything see the same idea which he is telling upanishad has told you have you have become so difficult eh? <clears throat> like all the no, tarka cannot get this now vacha you know all the, the speech cannot get you all these things you have told now you have become so easily available for for gopikas he has taken what other it takes it little further agre pasyami i see you in front of me what is that javali lobhaniyam piyuso plavito ham i have been like i am i become immortal the body is not that how the roga will be there tadanu tadu tare divya kaishora vesham a child krishna you know i see tarunya rambha ramyam Tarun has not come. Parama Sukhara sa swada roman chitangi. As I told you, I started with, I started with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Ravi itam Narada dihi Narada spoke. Bila sa upanishad sundari upanishad sundari mandali ischa. All the upanishads beautiful, brilliant words they have spoken. But I see you in front of me. See that is the that is the the, the whole essence is presented. by by bhattadri in this place okay 
so uh, you know uh, this is uh, this is this is this is how the whole text has been uh, written it is a text you know where where there are so many small small episodes he brings in he brings in so many small episodes like and to show how uh, how the uh, like uh, how the all that has happened in the life of krishna that is being spoken that the, in the in the in the bhagavata see the bhagavata becomes the basis for which on on, on the basis of which uh, this text has been written and um, and and uh, the, the radha comes in a very important way in the description of this text and uh, i i have not much time but one thing i wanted to tell you before i end my talk today it is a celebration of the world and the world can be celebrated when you have love with which i started and this is what this is what um, lila suba says he says bachcha pala charaha bachcha pala charaha kopi vachaha like he is going along with the cow head boys who another vachcha who is that sri vachcha lanchana and who is that why why uchcha vaya for the celebration it is celebrating celebrating the world see the krishna's life after what an amount of celebration renunciation along with along with celebration a renunciate alone can be a person who can celebrate renunciation and celebration going together he says uchchavaya kada bhavi tichuke mam lochane i am i am waiting for that time he says that when 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 i can i can i can have a glimpse of that god you know there are so many uh, things i i don't want to uh, like uh, take much of your time excepting saying that uh, like uh, how krishna and the gopis radha have been portrayed as non dual entities one one verse i would like to read before i end <clears throat> he says sayankale banante kusumita samaye saikate chandrikayam trilokya karsanangam suranara kanikam punna paanga murtim sebyam shringara bhave navarasa vanite gopakanya sahasrihi vandeham rasake lirata mati subhakam pasya gopala krishnam pasya gopala krishnam the most important thing is you are you are you are, you, you have been like you 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 are you are under the spell of your devotees you are you you you, you are not different you like it, it is it is the it is the relating the relating the consciousness with the body that is that is uh, that is being uh, brought very nicely like uh, very nicely by lilasuka and such a like i would like to say that i like I like to say like there, there are there are many things to say about lilasuka's poetry is extraordinary poetry and i don't think there is any parallel to this poetry in the whole sanskrit literature the many people have written many things but this is this is something which which remains unparalleled in the history you know vedantesika has tried i think vedantesika is also after that beautiful poetry vedantesika has written especially in yadavagudevam you know vande vrindavana charam ellathi janavallabham vadanti sambhavam dhama mayanti bhushitam you know that is that is that is that, that is you know that is that, the, the, the whole poetry the whole journey of the idea of liberation comes through this he says prema in prema all these things artha is there kama is there dharma is there that is that is that is that is a, that is a, that is a, that is the crux of this text i would like to end my talk 
with 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 again vatadri you know he says vatadri very very fond of it so agnyatvati mahatvam jadi ha nigaditam this is also this vatadri makes a summary of lila vatadri makes a not not a, not a short summary a long summary it is an elaborate exposition of lila sukha अज्ञातवादे महत्वम यदि हन गदितम विश्वनाथ क्षिमेथा स्त्रोत्र चैतत सहस्रोत्तरमिकतर तत्सादा भूयाधा नारायणीय श्रुतिशुचनुषा स्तुत्यता वर्णन स्फीत दिस इज दर्ड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंटली कंसन लीलावतारी इदमिह कुरुताम आयुरारोग्य सौख्यम आयु आरोग्य एंड सौख्य थ्री थिंग्स यू एंडाव फॉर अस टू एंजॉय द वर्ल्ड सेलिब्रेट द लिविंग एंड हाउ कैन द सेलिब्रेशन ऑफ लिविंग कैन बी डन माय लास्ट स्टेटमेंट फ्रेंड्स इन लॉ in love alone we can do if somebody has not loved start loving as i told you love never gets lost you get lost to the love love never fails you fail to love if somebody has not loved his wife start loving not loved his husband her husband start loving from today read listen krishna every this is the message of lila you know that that is love never fails you fail we fail to love but in this love in this love lies the celebration of the life and this celebration which is nothing but a journey in and through the 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 concept that is krishna the person that is krishna the ideal that is krishna which is the main essence that was that was given to us by many not in any small major by sadguru and sri vishnu mohan who was day we should we, we are celebrating today the birthday we are celebrating thank you all thanks uh, mahesh for this occasion to speak something to read this text ela like a little carefully for this occasion thanks to swami ji thank you uh pranam shri sri sadguru ma uh professor mishra wonderful again okay. so many uh, for 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 some time you know you have been speaking the uh, voice is not clear uh... <coughs> is it audible now ah uh, now audible yeah okay. so in the past also in other uh, forums and webinars by sri vishnu mohan foundation uh, professor mishra you have spoken uh, truly wonderfully and today is another one in that series and we look forward to even more uh, you started off so nicely bringing in you know the importance of bhagavatam in uh, your life in the life of society itself uh, how wonderfully you spoke about uh, you know that just one thought of krishna is overwhelming we don't need to uh, dwell in a lot of detail just just one thought how much it absorbs the mind uh, reminds me of an episode i heard in one talk once you know somebody was asked to recite the vishnu sahasnamam a young boy and that boy was spiritually advanced and uh, he stopped he started with vishwam and then he stopped he tried again he started with vishwam and then he stopped and apparently that is because he got so absorbed in the uh reality of bhagwan as vishwam he just it did occur to him to say the rest of the sastama <clears throat> reminded me a lot of that uh, particular uh, talk which i had heard um you also mentioned about uh, the, the importance of uh, practicing and understanding this divine love as distinct from just reading uh, a few days earlier in uh, one of uh, shri sadguru supadeshams which uh, i had read it is echoing the same thought you know one should practice rather than just read 
So Sadhguru says a few years back, Upadeshams, they want more Upadeshams. What have they done with what I have been saying all these years? These teachings are meant to be practiced and not just admired and kept aside. So I was thinking about that when you spoke. And it is so nice, uh, Professor Mishra, that as you have done in earlier talks, uh, you bring in texts from different parts of India. You know, the same uh, themes running through all kinds of different uh, uh, approaches to Sri Krishna. You, you have quoted a lot from Narayaniyam uh, and from other texts also. Very wonderful yet again. God's blessings that uh, I was able to listen to it. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Ravi. Pranam Sushi Sadhguru. Thank you, Dr. Mishra, for your talk. As Sri Kumar mentioned, wonderful to hear that. Uh, moving on, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Suganya Ananda Krishnan. Her topic of presentation is Krishna, the flute player. Dr. Suganya is, did a PhD at the University, at University of Hamburg, University of Hamburg on Kulasekra Alvaz Perumal Trumori. She publishes philological translation of work along with the whole medieval commentary in Mani pra Pravalam by Periyavakan Pillai. After working for NET Tamil project from 2014 to 18, she's currently a postdoctoral fellow at SFB 950, Center for the Studies of Manuscript Cultures, University of Hamburg. Her research interests include Tamil Bhakti poetry, medieval Sri Vaishnava writings in Mani Pravalam, commentary traditions in India, Tamil Sanskrit interactions and transmissions of texts via manuscripts, manuscripts in South India. All yours, Dr. Sukhani. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that introduction. Namaskaram, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Swamiji for having me here and all the organizers uh, who made sure that uh, the, the coordination went smoothly. Uh, without further ado, let me share the screen. Uh, as you well know, I'm going to talk about uh, Krishna, the, the, the magic, the magician flautist. Um, let's just give me two seconds. I'm just going to try to fiddle with, the, with this thing. No, that's not what I want. Okay, it should work now. Ah, can you see the slides? Yeah. Yes, yes visible. Okay, right. good. Right. So, um, so let us, I thought I should begin by um, reading out to you a verse by Piri Arbar, uh, which will hopefully set the tone for this talk um, as he describes the intense expression on Krishna's face as he plays the flute. Siruviralgal tadavi parimare singan kode seyyavai kuppalikka kuruvayar puruvam kudalippa kovindan kudal kudu udina podu Paravian Kanangal, Kudu Turandu, Bandu, Surundu, Padagad, Kedapa, Karavayan Kanangal, Kal Parapit, Kavindirangi, Seviata Hillave. So when Govinda played the flute, as his little fingers stroked and moved about the flute, his red eyes squinted, his red lips puckered, his eyebrows with little beads of perspiration overhung his eyes, flocks of birds abandoned their nests, came and surrounded him and lay motionless. Herds of milch cows spread out their legs, hung down their heads, and remained unable to wag their ears. So Krishna's plays are numerous. We know many of them, most of them perhaps. Um, the Dasamaskantha from the Bhagavata Purana tells us so many uh, of his stories, um, of his plays. And he also has many skills. Um, and he has performed many exploits and many acts of grace. But I think that perhaps his playing the flute is something that fits into all these categories, as hopefully I will show today. As a matter of fact, it has become iconographically so very important that it is one of the most um, identifying features of Krishna. I think perhaps that's why if we think of Krishna, many of us would simply remember his image of, you know, as playing the flute. Um, and even if we look at uh, the modern day interpretations, actors, for example, like NTR, if you see him as Krishna, he's often seen with a flute at all times, even in the most irrelevant context. Perhaps the flute, flute is for Krishna what the bow is to Rama, uh, something that really identifies him. So the Sanskrit Puranas, like the Bhagavata Purana, but also the Vishnu Purana and the um, Tamil Arva poetry and texts like those, 
go into raptures describing this fluting talent of Krishna's. And the second millennium Tamil literature, especially the two uh, Tamil renderings of the Bhagavata Purana are no exception. And I'm actually going uh, to focus especially on these two in this talk. I might refer to other, other uh, non-Tamil material, but these are um, the two main sources that I'm going to use. So which are those two? So the first one, I've already given a talk, I think, um, about these two uh, uh, in this August presence. So I won't get into too many details. Both of them were supposedly composed in the 16th century. Uh, the first one, perhaps slightly earlier, by Sivay Sudhavar, who probably was a smarta. He, he closely follows um, the Bhagavata Purana, the Sanskrit original, uh, he has slightly less than 5,000 verses, whereas the second one was clearly a Sri Vaishnava poet. Uh, he lived in the late 16th century, and um, uh, he doesn't really, like, he follows, of course, the Bhagavata Purana, but he's a, a lot more free. Uh, he, he's, his work is more like an encyclopedia. He gathers all Krishna-related stories and dedicates a few verses to them. So these two are the, the two poets that I'm going to uh, focus on today while discussing Krishna's uh, flute playing. So what's the plan today? So the plan is I'll begin by uh, focusing on the mesmerizing power um, of Krishna's flute playing. We all know how mesmerizing it can be, but I'll give you concrete examples. This talk will, especially this first part, will be more descriptive than analytical, but I think that it's actually worth it. Um, and the second, and then I'll move on to show that it's not just Mesmerizing people is perhaps not the only aim that Krishna has. Um, we will see in the second part that it has also a salvific effect. So if we go back to this verse by Piriyarva that I read out a minute ago, we can see that Krishna has started playing the flute. And in this verse, we already can see in the last two uh, lines that Creatures around him have started reacting to his uh, flute playing. We get the reaction of the birds and then also of his own cattle. So let's see who his audience is in the other Bhagavatas, the Tamil Bhagavatas, uh, and what they undergo and how they are uh, completely attracted by the music, etc. So that's the plan for the first part. So, so this is a verse in the in, in the Seve Survar Bhagavatam. So um, Seve Survar dedicates a verse to Krishna's own cows uh, that he grazes. They are his foremost privileged audience. We all know that they are the closest companions that he has other than his own friends, human friends. So Tiritta Kandre Vaivaita Vamule Yuna, Tirande Tirande Karita Puluna Karavai, Pungarpaha Singir, Murikurunga Vin Kavatriya. Uh, so the frolicking calves did not drink from the others they had lived. The milch cows did not eat the clump of cloth that they had nibbled, drinking in by their pretty ears the sweet flute music of the Vedic sprout with red lips and buds like teeth that caused sorrow to the plump beauty of the red hued sprouts of the flowering kalpaka tree. Okay, I'm not going to get into the fact that Krishna's mouth is rivaling the beauty of the kalpaka tree and its sprouts and, and, and fruits and whatnot. I'm just going to focus on Krishna's audience. And in this case, as I said, the animals uh, that he is grazing, they are stunned into forgetting to eat what is already in their mouths and in, in which is a real rare occurrence in real life. Uh, once you place food in, a, in an animal's mouth, you can be pretty sure there's very little that can uh, bring that out. I know that from a personal experience. So these cattle, though, are quite different. Why do they do so? Well, uh, the author, the poet gives a hint here because they are at the same time drinking in with their ears the sweet flute music. So they are busy taking in something else. So perhaps they're not quite so keen on, uh, on anything else. Uh, perhaps they're feeling full already. Now, this verse echoes the Bhagavata Purana verse. I mean, echoes are there everywhere. I'm just going to quote this, this one from the Bhagavata Purana, not too much. So I'll just read out the translation. It says the cows, their ears pricked, were also drinking the nectar of the flute music coming from Krishna's mouth. The cows stood transfixed with their mouths full of milk from the dripping udders 
shedding tears in their hearts. They caressed Govinda with their eyes. So we can see here that the, fl the flute music is not just food for their ears, it's nectar. Why is it nectar? Presumably because it comes straight out of Krishna's mouth. And in that case, how could just grass and mother's milk satisfied after drinking in that nectar from Krishna's mouth? Well, there you go, you have your answer now. But then was it only these domestic animals, these Krishna's gentle sattvika cows that are affected by his music? But perhaps not. We've already seen that Piriyarva mentions the, the birds. And here Arunaladasa, the other uh, writer of the Bhagavatam in Tamil, lists all the birds that turned up as soon as they heard Krishna's uh, flute music. So uh, I'll just read the translation. Coils, peacocks, doves, bush miners, prattling parrots, swans, long cranes, pelicans, the joyful angel birds, flocks of large herons, fledglings, along with Asunam, all these came quickly. So you can see, just imagine the place just invaded by all the animals, all the birds that ever exist surrounding Krishna as soon as he starts playing his flute. Just a quick note on this, uh, perhaps you don't know what this is, Asunam. Asunam is, 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 is mentioned in the Sangam poetry in Tamil. It is believed to be a creature and I think perhaps a bird-like creature, which apparently was very susceptible uh, to harmony and uh, which was fascinated by the notes of music. So when hunters wanted to catch it, it was virtually impossible. So what they would do is play very nice music. And then when it's completely transfixed, what they did is suddenly produce drum beats. And it just died almost of a heart attack because that contrast was unbearable for it. So I think here, adding th this bird here shows that Krishna's music was pretty, pretty good. So there you go. But of course, he had no intentions of killing them off or catching them. So, um, so you have, we saw cattle and then the birds. So is it just harmless birds like these ones that are attracted? Well, not quite. You can see that wild animals, ferocious animals are also um, attracted to this music. So I'll read the translation here. Elephants that shed must like rains, male lions, tigers, herds of deer, all joined together as one species, looked at the elephant-like man who stood with a bamboo pipe and stood melting like drone figures hearing that music. So we can see that ferocious wild animals are in a trance as well. And even animals that cannot, in the natural state of things, cohabit with each other, actually we find them together. But this is a very common thing to find. I think uh, the predator and the prey, the tiger and the deer, for example, drinking from the same pond is a story that is found in many types of um, texts and oral traditions. For example, I think it's in the Mahabharata. I think it's in Madras country. They say that uh, the lion and the deer drink together. And also in some of the ashramas we have seen um, you have this ascetic who's so, who has so much sattvika, who's sattvika guna that, uh, you know, creatures around him live in peace and harmony. So in this case, I think in those cases, well, you know, those animals are submitted to the king or the sattvika guna's power of an ascetic. In this case, the animals are subdued simply because they are mesmerized. Uh, they are controlled by the divine music of Krishna thanks to which their own essential nature has become modified. We will see more and more that all these animals and these people we are going to meet in a minute or so, they, their essential nature just changes as soon as they hear this, this mesmerizing magical music. Anyway, uh, we can notice that earlier on we heard, I think Professor Mishra mentioned a picture, like a portrait, they are like a portrait. So we have the same idea echoed also in these writings. We can imagine that they're stunned, they're motionless. All you see is, is a paintings of, of this scenery of Krishna playing and all these creatures just stunned by his music, which perhaps it reinforces the idea that the poet here, uh, also his colleague, I would tend to think, is trying to paint an idyllic portrait of the countryside during Krishna's concert. Okay, now, Arula Aladasar also quotes, uh, makes a list. He likes make, making lists everywhere that I've seen. Uh, he makes also a list of wild animals that are uh, there to listen to Krishna's music. And here, 
uh, he, he speaks of hogs, lions, tigers, elephants, shiny sheep, buffaloes, bears, etc. And later on, he mentions the, uh, the snake as well. So Dasar describes them as having uh, stopped blinking and they start listening intently to this music and they are totally melted by this music. So I think here perhaps what we need to note is that this list includes animals that are considered less noble. Obviously hogs and buffaloes are clearly less noble than an elephant or a lion, for example. But what we need to remember is that perhaps it doesn't matter what animal it is, predator or prey, noble or not, Krishna's music affects them all equally. Just as his grace touches everyone and everything equally, Krishna's grace or his music does not and cannot discriminate. So we can see that here. Uh, so Dasar actually, as I said, also adds the snakes. I haven't given it here. He says that the snakes stood transfixed. They stopped dancing and they're just stunned uh, in this list. And it's interesting because Sivay Surabar also uh, picks out these uh, the, the snakes in his own verses and two types of snakes, actually, the one that live in this human world. And he calls them the cruel, fiery mouths, poison pouring snakes emitted good nectar. Once again, we see them changing their nature. I mean, they don't willfully change their nature. It's just that the music changes their nature almost uh, automatically. But what is perhaps more uh, surprising is that the music reaches all the way, uh, it goes all the way to Kailasa, where Shiva's sir, uh, snakes are also um, affected. So we can see here, the serpents adorned upon, uh, upon his body perform dance, listening to the undiminished music uttered by the bamboo pipe of the Supreme Lord. So we can see here that whereas some snakes are stunned, they were dancing and then they stop, these snakes, Shiva snakes, start dancing because they're so mesmerized, just as a snake would dance in front of a, uh, uh, of a snake charmer due to that pipe. So Krishna has become that snake charmer here, I think. And it makes me wonder why he even bothered to use violence to submit Kalia, right? He could very easily have just played his flute and Kalia would have submitted. Well, anyway, he probably had his reasons that we don't know anything of. Right. It's not just animals, but also trees and plants, the fauna, but also the flora that is affected by Krishna. And in this case, it's actually dead trees who spring back to life. So we can see here, due to the music fashioned by the Lord with the fiery discus with round rims, dry trees put forth leaves. Well, this is hardly surprising, I would say, since after all, even the trees showed emotion when in the Ramayana, Rama left. Rama was about to leave, I think, um, Ayodhya. Uh, Valmiki says, Abhivriksha parimlanaha. Even the tree is withered. So it's hardly surprising that in Krishna's presence, thanks to his um, healing music, divine healing music, they come back to life. I'm not saying they are the same trees, but hey, why not? So there you go. Um, so from the examples we have seen and the examples we will see, we can clearly see is that nothing seems to follow the law of the nature. Why is it so? Well, perhaps because the maker of those laws is in content now, he's in total control now. As a matter of fact, we can see in the next few verses or that even the elements themselves, the Panchabhutas, etc., they too act different or even against their own nature. The sun and the breeze, meaning it's the sun and vayu, for example, the sun turns into something very cool, whereas the breeze turns into something very hot. Okay, admittedly, it's only for the Bopis who are suffer suffering from Biraha, that's there in Kavya since, I don't know, since time immemorial, that women in love um, find the cool breeze burning. But still, you can see that the sun has become cool, whereas the breeze has become uh, uh, hot. So again, everything seems to change. But is it only on this earth? Well, not clearly not, because we've already mentioned Shiva's um, uh, serpents that change their nature. But actually, even beyond this, this world, and not just the serpents, many other beings, uh, superhuman beings, shall we put it that way, are also affected 
uh, uh, by this music, as we can see. So uh, Arunala Dasa actually gives a list. Once again, as I said, he gives many lists. I won't go through all of them. Here he quotes all the dancing, celestial dancing women, like Rambha, Urvashi, etc. Uh, he says that they actually get so flustered that, and they also start melting like, um, like wax on fire, etc. And here you have a slightly more exalted list of people, uh, beings like Gandharvas, Yakshas, uh, Kinnaras and Kimpurushas, etc. So the, those people, Arulala says, Arulala Dasa says, they simply drop their uh, instruments. We know that the uh, Vidyadharas, the, the, the Kinnaras, etc., they were musicians, they are divine musicians, celestial musicians. So they drop whatever instruments they had, they were just stunned. Well, it seems that Krishna's magical music makes them all stop whatever they were doing, whatever they were good at, and draws them towards him because he's the only person who actually masters them, whatever they may think about themselves and their own talents. And we can also see that they totally forget themselves. Uh, and they also react in different ways. Some are completely stunned, some get agitated. So I think uh, Krishna's music has different effects depending on the person. Um, so, the thing that we can carry on towards the next is that, well, it seems to me right now that Krishna is actually almost like a, the Pied Piper, you know, except that he doesn't have any bad intentions. The list doesn't stop here. And we have greater deities being affected uh, by this divine music. Okay, is it going to change? Yes, it is changing. We have Indra and Shiva also um, deeply moved uh, to tears here. Indra is described as, as shedding tears here, and Shiva is also described as shedding tears, which is actually a little bit funny, I think. He says, the joy that filled the heart of him who is half woman, brimmed with pure water, and flowed joining the long fiery eye so that it is, meaning the fire, became extinguished. So um, we know that here Shiva is, is known as the Ardhanarishwara, which means that if he's shedding tears, it's likely that he is shedding tears, but also his wife from the other half of the body. So both of them are shedding tears, they are so moved. But another thing that is funny here is, is that the poet says, the water that comes of their eyes actually extinguishes the fire from his third eye. I, I don't know, you know, how can it go up? Well, maybe that third eye is also shedding tears or God knows, you know, maybe the gravity actually works differently in Thailasa, I don't know. But this thing happens anyway. So it seems that the shedding tears is truly a purificatory uh, act. We can see here pure water, he says, for the tears. Um, and, and this a purificatory act that will cleanse them uh, of, their, um, of their blemishes. What blemishes could gods like that have? Well, perhaps from a Sri Vaishnava perspective, Ahankara, for example, and Mamakara can be washed away through this, these, these tears that come out, out of pure bhakti. So this is the case in Indra Loka and in uh, in Kailasa. Now, in Satyaloka, a marital crisis is happening due to this music. So uh, let me read this out. The lady whom the flower born four faced Brahma delighted in embracing left his tongue and began to learn dancing well, hearing the music emerging from the flute holes. So you can see that the goddess of arts, who said to live on her husband's tongue, so that in order to enable him the recitation of the Veda so that he can create, and who's also said, to dance upon the tongues of the eloquent people, she has decided to leave his tongue and his embrace and uh, in order to go and learn to dance properly thanks to Krishna's music. So uh, it clearly people who thought they were very good at what they did in the best in their own field, whether, whether it is Apsarases or the, the divine musicians or Saraswati, well, they realize that there is a master above them who is actually uh, has so much to uh, give them so that they can learn. So perhaps we can even speak of the educational role played by Krishna's music. Hmm. Now, if these people can be so moved, do we even have to speak of the gopis? All the poets uh, suggest give write many verses. Uh, about the effect of the flute on uh, the gopis. Obviously, I cannot uh, quote them all. This one I picked because it has an echo to one of the verses that I already read. So this one says, 
Even if tiger and deer began to behave like one species due to the flute music of Krishna, who is like the neck of big peacocks with long tails, the breeze tiger of a slow gait that coils around the flowers fought with the deer like gopis with pretty black curls with blossoming jasmine. So we've already seen that the, the real tigers and the deer are united by the magical music of Krishna. It's as if they become one species. But here, the, 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 the breeze, which had already turned um, hot, is also, has also turned into a tiger. This is something that is also imagined by Kamban. So um, this poet is just repeating what Kamban said. So this, this horrible tiger, tiger turned breeze is attacking the poor gopis who are losing all their self-control and who can't stand one minute of viraha. They can't stand one minute of separation from Krishna. So as I said before, listeners are either stunned or they get agitated. The gopis actually get first stunned and then agitated because they want to rush. We'll, we'll see more of it in a minute. It just shows that Krishna's music affects everybody. Nobody is left indifferent. The, the, the way it affects is different. So it seems almost like, you know, during the pralaya, uh, it is said that Narayana absorbs all things towards himself and he, while he swallows them to keep the whole thing inside his tummy. Similarly here, he sorts, he's like a magnet that attracts everything and everybody towards him. And he uses his music for that. Anyway. The gopi, this takes us to our second part, because as soon as we move into the, the gopi domain, we also see the, the salvific effect of the flute music. And here we also enter the domain of the individual. So of course, I'm going to mention the groups. We've seen birds and animals and uh, wild animals and whatever. Now we are going to move to the gopis and sometimes very particular ones. How much time do I have? I still have a few minutes. So, um, so the gopis hear this music and they get stunned and then they get agitated because they want to reach Krishna because clearly the flute music is, is, um, is, is so attractive. It's almost like a summons to them. Everybody manages to get there except perhaps one woman, one gopi who's not quite so lucky or perhaps she is the luckiest of them, uh, of them all. You can tell me later on. Here's Arulala Das, and I'm mainly going to use Arulala Das's verses here. So let me read this verse. When women with increased love ran, their thick black locks hanging down, their hearts melting, the mother of one woman who became scorchingly furious reached her quickly and held her by both her hands. With that, she did not know how to reach him. So you can see that one girl has been caught. And how does she react, do you think? Does she cry like Indra and Shiva? Is she stunned? Not quite. Let's have a look. Nandantan maindan padalalangalai ni naindu naindu sindayal udalin avi ariyadi seera neeril andarat tamarar puvin marihal puriya andra sundara vimanam eri tulangiya kediyil pukkal. The soul from the body of she whose thoughts were wounded thinking of the goodness of Nanda's feet reached the feet of Hari. As the immortals from the sky poured showers of flowers, she climbed upon the very pretty aerial car and entered the effulgent heaven. So thinking of Krishna's padam, she's taken to Paramapadam. Oh yes, she sheds her body. She is Chintayanti. She is famously known as Chintayanti, as we shall see. She goes to a world where she can be unfettered and she can give all the love she has to give him as much as she wants whenever she wants. Here I'm tempted to think of the mother as a metaphor for samsara that tries to hold on the jivatma back and keep it to itself. And the flute comes as a savior because it allows her to go beyond all these, uh, all this prison, exactly. So, um, so with us notice, I think, uh, the salvific um, nature of the flute. It brings one very close to Krishna indeed. If not when he is an incarnation close to him, then at least close to him permanently in Vaikuntha. And the poet doesn't stop here. He has another verse to describe this. 
Meditating upon the effulgent feet, which cannot be seen even by those who perform countless severe austerities, tapas, fostering red fire, or by Brahma on the big fragrant lotus, she, becoming the com contemplative woman, Chintayanti, reached the good heaven that rises greatly. People other than her lost it. So this girl, without doing anything really, achieved what those who perform countless acts of austerities, I don't know, karma, yoga, jnana, yoga, etc., as mentioned earlier on, she got what they could not even imagine, despite troubling themselves so much. She managed, the slip of a girl managed to get it so very easily. And as I said, she's referred to as Chintayanti, the woman who contemplates. Now, this lady is, uh, her story is a popular one among the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas in the 13th century, 14th centuries, and also later. Uh, many of them mention her, for example, Nampurlai, um, calls Namarva as Dirgha Chintenti because he, his contemplation lasts much, much longer. His suffering lasts longer and that sort of thing. Uh, Aragya Manavala Pirmal Nayana, who's a younger brother of Pule Lokacharya, lists, makes a list of 21 people whom Bhagavan accompanied uh, on their path to liberation. He mentions very cryptically because these are sutras, Idaichi, the cow herd is, so it's a reference to Chintenti. Whereas Pule Lokacharya gets, you know, a bit more detail. Uh, he lists her among people who died for the sake of Bhagavan. Now he says, Jatayus and Pillaitra Narayur Arayar abandoned their bodies. For Chintayanti, her, her body left on its own. Now who is Pillaitra Narayur Arayar? That's a Sri Vaishnavachari. He was a priest, I think. And uh, when he was visiting, I think, Tottiyam uh, Pirmal Temple, somebody had lit, uh, had put fire to the Murti, the Murti of Pirmal. So he actually threw himself onto the Murti uh, to save it from damages and in the process uh, shed his own body. So Pralelo Kachara is trying to show that these people gave up voluntarily their body. Jatayu, you know, he gave up his body uh, while fighting Ravana, whereas for Chintayanti, it happened on its own. Now, it's very interesting because uh, Manavala Mahmunigal, later on, I think it's later in the 14th century, he gives uh, her story while commenting on the sutra where in which he unpacks the process through which she obtained moksha. It's not as easy as the Bhagavata writers presented because there's a process. It's not just that she thought of him and he got moksha, uh, she got moksha. It's a bit more complex than that. So he's going to explain that. Okay, this is, uh, what happens here is, this is his commentary on the verse, on the sutra that we just saw. He begins by quoting verses from the Vishnu Purana. So what I'll do now is just quote, and give you the translation of the Vishnu Purana verses. How much time do I have? Not, oh yeah, I do, five minutes. Um, read out these Vishnu Purana verses and then, you know, they themselves are self-explanatory and still if we need, I'll also read the translation of this. So here's her story. One saw her elders outside the house. So staying indoors, she closed her eyes and contemplated Govinda as if she were as one with him. The bliss she felt in doing so released her from the force that she had acquired. Her anguish at not seeing Krishna freed her from her sins. Contemplating the creator of the world in the form of the highest absolute, another of the herders girls won liberation just because she sighed so deeply. So the story, the original story presumably is in the Vishnu Purana, not in the Bhagavata Purana, perhaps why. Um, um, Sivay Surva doesn't mention it. So what does Pranavada Mahmurigal say on this? He basically will, let's just read the translation. He basically just um, uh, re-explains this in modern, uh, not Tamil, Maniprabala, which, so that it's easier to, uh, to read. So he says, as said in the Vishnu Purana verses that I just read, on the day of the sacred Kuravai dance, hearing the music of his sacred flute, she set forth in order to go to Brindavana, but seeing the elders, she stood back, unable to go. And she had all her merits, Punya, and since Papa destroyed through the faultless joy that came from having her thoughts gone to Krishna by meditating upon him, and the limitless sorrow that came from not obtaining him, respectively. As memories of him went on, her breathing stopped, being unable to survive due to the sorrow of not obtaining him. Therefore, her body left her in such a way that there was no need for her to give it up. This is what he means, he says. As you probably know, 
we pay for our happiness with our punya, which keeps decreasing as a result. And we also get rid of our sins by undergoing sorrow. So this gopi who could not go to Krishna was so, so, so sad that she lost all her papas, but she was so ecstatically happy at listening to this flute music that she lost all her merits. So her account of Papa and Punya became neutral. And that's when liberation occurs. We probably this, this is the point of view of the Sri Vaishnavas that Punya is just as bad as Papa, perhaps even worse because it prevents us from getting liberation. And worse, it gives us so many good things that we want to stay back in the samsara. Anyway, this episode tells us about the power of Krishna's music. Uh, the music that it produces with his flute, the kind of bliss that it produced is narrated here. As I said, this is not related in the Bhagavata Purana, so Sebe Suruva doesn't have it, but Arulala Dasar has it. Both the, the verses from the Tamil Bhagavatas that I quoted here are from one a chapter. Both of them dedicate a whole chapter on Krishna's playing the flute. But surprisingly, I found something like extremely surprising that he actually, this uh poet Arulala Dasar actually has another separate chapter which he which he calls Chintayanti Padalam and here Chintayanti becomes the gopi the cow herders becomes one of the rishipatnis and I still don't understand why because he calls her Chintayanti already in the other episode and he calls this episode as Chintayanti and Chintayanti is one of the rishipatnis you probably know the story of Chintayanti Krishna goes uh, to graze his cows and one day he's very tired and hungry so he sends his friends to go and get some food from some of the rishis who are performing some kind of yajna they shoo them away they go away so he sends them again to their wives and those women are very very happy to bring that food and it's described here you know they made uh, all sorts of flavored food and they fill them in pots to the brim and they want to bring it to Krishna themselves except that their husbands try to call them uh, catch them up and they even try to you know, rush after them they scold them but the women are cleverer they just disperse and, and go to Krishna except for one woman this poor woman who was really bewildered is caught and tied up by her husband who's really angry so that she cannot go to Krishna and she actually perishes. You can clearly see the parallel between Chintayanti, the cowherdess, who was stopped by her mother, and Chintayanti, the Rishipatni, who stopped by another member of the family. Both of them want to go to Krishna. Both of them are uh, desperate because they can't, and they, the, the body goes. And again, we have a very similar verse by the same poet within a few verses uh, distance. He says, the poets rejoice saying that it was amazing that the woman should reach the supreme abode of Madhava, which is not seen despite performing perfect sacrifices, that's yajnas, giving many excellent donations, dana, even to those who afflict their bodies, performing hard penances, that's tapas, for an immeasurable length of time uh, with nothing but air as food. No point in doing all these things. No, what matters is the kind of bhakti, deep, desperate uh, bhakti that you feel that is going to change uh, the, the game and take you all the way to uh, the eternal uh, presence of Krishna. Because in this world, it's not going to happen. You have to go to Vaikuntha. A few concluding thoughts. So we see that both poets paint an idyllic portrait of the cowherd's hamlet as Krishna in, um, um, plays the flute and he impacts and perhaps attracts thousands of creatures, birds, humans, fauna, flora alike through his flute playing. Uh, Krishna's music has a summoning role as we saw. It attracts, it mesmerizes everyone and everything as if it were not just a flute, but rather a magic wand. Uh, wielded by the great magician of, of all that Krishna is. And the music has different effects, as we saw, uh, upon its audience. Um, some are stunned into becoming motionless, as we saw. Uh, some become agitated, some cry, some rush towards him. We also saw that, unsurprisingly, Mayon's irresistibly enchanting music mm -hmm. has salvific effects as well, perhaps for the best among them. Uh, and the best is not based on uh, whether they have a superior birth or not. It's based solely on the depth of their uh, devotion, um, which is perhaps why I think that, um, you know, it gives, as I said, it grants moksha. I think that his flute playing is not just a skill uh, because we can see he's better than many people at art, 
but also one through which he performs many exploits, such as captivating everyone. And uh, it also acts, um, it's also an act of grace uh, by liberating the most deserving, I think. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much again, Dr. Suganya. Wonderful talk. And uh, you kind of, what should I say, brought the flute and his music almost to life. Okay? It's, it's, it's wonderful. I say almost to life because, you know, I had to uh, kind of look at a lot of other things as part of the background support for this. So was able to listen into 99%, but not the 1% balance. Apologies for that. But it's really wonderful yet again. Uh, I like the... The, the, right in the beginning, you know, you of the talk, you likened the flute to Sri Krishna, like the bow to Sri Rama. You know, it's, it is truly symbolic, actually. There's many places we see just the flute or sometimes a peacock feather, right? And it's, it's kind of symbolic uh, in a very nice way. Um, <clears throat> when you spoke about uh, the sound of the flute, you know, not just uh, for the humans uh, and the various examples you gave, you know, including of... Uh, Chintayanti and and so on. Uh, you you expressed uh, you know a bit of puzzlement as to how it is that even to the realm of Lord Shiva and uh, you know even among uh, uh, beings which are not considered normally you know when we talk about uh, sattvic beings like snakes and so on, how they also get totally absorbed in it. And I was just reminded of that uh, uh, two things. One is in uh, Sri Manarayanam when uh, talking about the uh, Rasalila, uh, there's a few uh, cantos there which talk about the Rasalila. So he, he mentions there about even the rocks have melted. Okay, uh, That's really wonderful. Uh, and you spoke very nicely about how it is that that kind of Ananya Bhakti, you know, uh, you get totally absorbed. So I'm just, uh, you know, I was reminded of two things. I'll uh, take half a minute and then hand it back to you, Ravi, if you don't mind, or maybe one minute. Uh, in one of the wonderful episodes around Sri Ramakrishna, when he is asked, uh, you know, how should one be, he takes that person and pushes him into the Ganges. <laughs> For, so then, when that person comes out breathless, Sri Ramakrishna says, "Your entire focus was on, you know, on breathing, and that is the kind of intensity you should have." Um, I'm going to read out one uh, of uh, Sri Sadhguru's uh, Upadeshams about the flute itself, and then I'll hand it over to you, Ravi. Uh, the divine flute of Krishna is most soul enchanting. If you hear it for even an instant, you will forget the world, family, everything. You will think of only that and that alone. <clears throat> but can you hear it? Only after millions of births in which much effort has been made, can you hear it? But unfortunately, the mass of people are deaf to it and do not even know of its existence. But they also, after their souls evolve into the higher regions of light, will hear the enchanting notes of the divine flute and attain true bhakti. Um, this is, uh, you know, I just thought it was quite apt to read this. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, Her Holiness Sri Sadhguru had said of some time back and it was posted in the WhatsApp group. So thank you once again. Look forward to many more of your ongoing talks. Uh, Pranam Shushi Sadhguru, over to you, Ravi. Thank you, Dr. Chikanya and all the other speakers who spoke before her. With this, we conclude the plenary session one, the morning session. Uh, we'll regroup again at 2 p.m. Uh, with another, hopefully, very uh, involved and impressive array of speakers who will be speaking on the same topic of Pala Krishna. So with this, we come to the end of the session. We'll meet again at 2 p.m. Thank you. Pranam Shri Sadhguru. Pranam Swamiji. Thank <clears throat> you.